Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Welcome back. Uh, I know some of you are eager to get started in the chat room, and it's Friday night, so it's it's really arguably the best program we have because it's dedicated to having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say hello to everybody before we get started here. I'll ask Brother Ben, would you give the, the congregation a greeting, Brother? Yes, hello everyone. It's good to be here uh, on another fellowship. Um, Angel and Lisa said they are both coming, but they might be a little late. So, All right then, and Brother Cripps, say hi to everybody. And uh, I got, you've got an announcement, don't you? I do indeed. First of all, I'll just say uh, welcome to another fun Fellowship Friday. I'm excited to be here. And Brother Luke was talking before the show about how quickly this this week seemed to go by. And uh, we, we it wasn't a debate. We were just discussing really briefly uh, whether time is speeding up or and I didn't have a chance to say because we were, we were getting ready to start. But I, I, I think when I was a kid, people used to say, um, enjoy your youth because it sure goes by fast. My grandpa was one of those people that said that all the time. And I was like, oh, grandpa. Uh, but as I've gotten older, it does seem like now we all know time is the same. It's the same as it was when we were kids. And it seemed like the sum summer stretched out forever. And it was awesome. Uh, and then you get in the workforce and, and have uh, responsibilities. And you just watch the, watch the time just move right by you. And all of a sudden you're decade older and you're like where's where it all gone so for all you youngsters out there enjoy your youth <laughs> <laughs> um so i have i do have an announcement to make and i'm uh, happy to say that uh uh jennifer my fiance uh soon to be wife we're getting married september 19th as i announced one night so it's uh, very very close uh but she has joined us uh on fun fellowship friday so everybody make sure and make her feel welcome in the chat uh and here she is jen hello Hey. hey, hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I've, awesome. I've really enjoyed listening to ever since you guys started doing the true and false questions. Yes. Um, I've just really, really, I mean, I enjoyed it before, but this really took it to a whole other level. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it tonight. Awesome. Thanks. Jen. Hopefully I won't embarrass myself. <laughs> no, you'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, that should be the least of your concerns. Uh, none of us are expected to be right about everything anyway. So, no. uh, Thanks, Luke. but have you ever had um, uh, as you're listening and uh, you, you think, man, that question, I'd love to say something about that. But now you have an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's so true. I've always felt when I'm in the chat room, I'm very limited because of the, you know, it's, it's so much more difficult to communicate with a chat, a, a short text. And it's so much easier and uh, more uh, more likely to be able to make your point correctly instead of being taken wrong if you speak. Yeah, that's true. All right, let's look at the chat room and see who's in there here. We got Brother Hendricks uh, with his moderator ranch. So thank you for being here again tonight. I know that that job you have there, moderating or as a deacon in the church, you uh, have a big responsibility and you are greatly appreciated. Uh, and now we got Sister Heather here uh, helping you, Brother Hendricks. The two, between the two of you, I'm sure the chat room's in really good hands. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, hello to everybody else. Uh, Third King Nine and uh, Fang Omega Wolf and all others. Uh, so, Glad you all could make it again another Friday night. And you know that Friday nights, uh, we, we put more time into these programs, but it seemed like the time still zooms right by. So it'll be time to say good night before you know it. That's, um, now, if you are new, though, um, I hope that uh, uh, let us know if you're just visiting or checking it out for the first time so that we can acknowledge you and welcome you. Um, and... Uh, it, it, or the, kind of the, the protocol or format that we're using here is um, you can submit um, two fault statements. And, and that's the, the, the discussion part of the program is based upon the panel and the chat room answering a series of true false uh, statements. So as you, once you see how this is going and you start uh, answering the questions and participating in this, uh, if you feel like you've got a question you want to just put it in all caps here. 
and uh, either tonight or soon we'll be able to add that to our list. Um, all right, uh, if there's nothing else, we might as well go ahead and get started in the discussion here. Awesome. Um, Brother Ben, could you post the first uh, true-false statement for us? Yes, I will. And uh, tonight's show or program is sponsored by Heather Bridgman because most of the questions are from her and they're very thought provoking and just excellent. And I think we're all going to enjoy uh, each of them. So the first one is true or false. It was unfair for God to kill Uzzah for putting his hand on the ark. Surely his tripping and falling was an accident. Are you guys familiar with the uh, episode in the Old Testament with Uzzah, yeah. or I think yes. that's his name? Okay. Good question. Yep. Wow, you were right. You were right, Ben, right out of the gate. That's, uh, that's good. If I'm not mistaken, Jason, you and I had conversations about this when we were reading through it a month ago. We sure did. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and try to answer this in the, in the poll, but I don't want to give my answer yet to everybody. So... Um, who would like to go first on this one? Anyone? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, uh, first of all, my answer is uh, certainly false, uh, but that doesn't mean that I haven't thought about this and wondered. And at first glance, it does kind of seem unfair. Uh, but later, as you learn more and read more and start to really uh, understand God, I don't think we ever fully understand him, but we have eternity to do that when it comes time for, for it. Um, but we know that it's a shadow. Um, it, it's definitely a shadow for us to look at and and uh, and uh, about the law. You know, there were there were several people throughout the scripture that died, uh, and we look at that from modern standards and say, "Well, you died for you killed someone for picking up a stick on the Sabbath." Uh, you have to understand the deeper concept of that uh, for time. Um, it does seem unfair, but if they would have followed, here's the thing. I'm not saying he should have died necessarily from my perspective, um, but if he would have followed the instructions to begin with, the ark never would have fallen over in the first place. And I don't know specifically it was if it was his fault or someone else's. It might have been David's fault. I don't know. Uh, but uh, he he definitely paid the, the consequences of it. So uh, I believe God is always fair, even if we don't understand it. So uh, there was no other answer for me other than certainly false. Um, uh, just because I don't understand it doesn't mean that uh, God doesn't have reasons for something. So that's my answer. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, Sister Lisa's here, so we'll say hello to her. And uh, Ben, you can answer the question next, if you will. Sister Lisa, want to say hello? Yeah. Hey, uh, Brother Luke. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, hello. Hey, guys. Um, oh, who is that that we have new tonight? Is that somebody new? Yes, that's Jennifer. Hi, Jen. How are you hey, doing? Lisa. Great. How are you? Awesome. We've heard a lot about you. It's, it's good to finally meet you in the chat here. Yeah, yes. I feel like I know you already because I've listened to so many shows. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Aww. Nice to make your acquaintance. Thank you so much, Lisa. You too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Uh, you know, I remember a pastor from mine back in the day who answered this question. So I'm going to cheat and use his answer. <laughs> um, which was who told what's the gentleman's name? Uzziah. Is that his Uzzah. name? Uzzah. Okay. Uh, that God needed help. Yeah. When, when the ark slid was starting to slide, the Lord can protect his ark. Yeah. And if the, if the understanding was you not to touch it and only certain people could touch it and handle it, then that's what should have happened. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sure it probably was just reactionary on his part. I don't think it was in the front, even intended to be in the front. But the Lord is trying to show people something. I, and I would equate this to Ananias and Sapphira. I don't think that he, when he fell dead, he was lost. Okay? I don't think because a lot of people think when people fall dead sometimes in, in the Bible because of something they did, if that person wasn't necessarily wicked, even if they were doing wrong, they, they are not necessarily lost. The Lord is judging to show something to everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and see, we have this opinion because of dumb movies like Final Destination, all that crap, that <laughs> death is the worst thing that can happen. Uh-uh. No. Yeah. The, the Bible, that's why the Bible says 
Don't fear him that can destroy the body, but rather fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. See, death is not the worst thing that can happen. It's what happens afterwards. And there's no indication this man was lost. I don't believe Ananias and Sapphira is lost. I believe the Lord is showing us he's still, even today in the new covenant, he's not to be played with. Because mm -hmm. I keep reminding people, Paul said there is a sin unto death. I do not say that we should even pray for it. Okay, so why is that there if it's not something we're supposed to take heed of? Because, see, there are people who, if the Lord didn't check them by putting a reverential fear in their heart as to what, okay, uh, as it says in Romans, the goodness and the severity of God, people forget that's there. Why is it there? It's a warning God is not to be played with. Mm. He's, he's, he's not a game. There's supposed to be a reverential fear for the Lord. And sadly, in these days, a lot of people have lost it. And sometimes he'll allow things like this to put, be a reminder that he's not to be played with. That person, I don't believe he was lost. I don't think Ananias and Sapphira was lost. But it was judgment to show God is not to be played with. And if he says something, he means it. He means what he says, and he says what he means. And we should, we should remember that. But love it. But uh, I think uh, that's my answer. Uh, he, he, I think he, he thought he was helping God, but see, there's some things when God, when God say hands off, he means hands off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I was going to go with Ben, but I'd like to stick with the, the, the sisters here and let them finish up. <laughs> they're, they're on a roll. So let, let's have uh, sister Jen, uh, go next. Well, I was going to say Lisa stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with her and I agree with what Jason shared as well. And it makes me think of, um, you know, I just finished uh, summer camp for there's an after school program here in town that runs in the summer. And it reminds me, it's not exactly the same, but it reminds me of when you're a teacher and you're heading, you know, you're the head over, over children and you're teaching them rules and how to play games and how to conduct themselves with others. And there are times where you, you may have to enforce rules with kids that, made a mistake and they're not normally like a, a troubled kid or a kid that's causing a lot of trouble. But in order to make sure the let the, the playing field is level when you when it comes to discipline, you have to follow through with it. Um so it, it reminds me of that and I, I loved Sister Lisa's answer. It's uh beautifully said. I agree. Awesome. Don't mess with the teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and don't mess with the teacher. Father God. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, all right, Brother Ben, what do you say? Uh, well, the question says, is, is, is it unfair? And the word unfair could be interpreted to mean unjust. And we know that there is definitely no injustice or unrighteousness with God. Um, further, um, this particular episode, um, I read this in the, in the Bible what, 10 years ago when I knew next to nothing. Um, and I haven't revisited that story since, but I'm definitely looking forward to swinging back and, and catching it, uh, all these Old Testament types and shadows. And I think this is exactly uh, that is a type and shadow. Um, and I, remember, I, I don't, so I don't remember all the details, but if I, I, I remember this episode did stand out to me like, whoa, what's going on here? And the thing that stood out to me was, and I, I, I might not have all the details right, but first of all, I don't recall that he tripped and fell. I think what happened was that the, uh, the, they put the ark on two beasts of burden, two ox essentially, and the ox uh, tripped, lost its footing, and it started to fall. Uh, and so he tried to kind of brace the ark so that it wouldn't fall off the, the beasts of burden. Uh, and that's when he died. And um, and I think also too that before then that God gave a warning basically saying, no, only the priests can touch the holy things. Um, and, and now thinking back of that now, something just kind of uh, – clicked in my head um but but even that even back then i i i i uh it occurred to me that hey uh don't help god with the burdens of the law is basically what it is christ is the our christ is our sin bearer he's the he's a law the burden the he's the carrier of the laws essentially he put all the law on his shoulders and uh died for it and so all the law demands and uh all the laws demands were placed on him just like those ox um and so don't, you know, don't help that. Don't help God with the burdens of the law is what I came back. Even back then when I knew next to nothing, I realized, oh, okay, hey, the law is holy. It, you know, man is defiled. Uh, in fact, that's why I, I think uh, 
you know, you couldn't, they couldn't create altars with, um, uh, of, to, like man-made tools. They had to use stone to create these altars and things like that. Uh, Cripps mentioned the, um, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. And again, that's the picture of Christ's rest, his grace, that you can't mix work with grace. Again, another uh, warning, I believe a type of a warning is that you no, know, no, no man can, can handle the burdens of the law. It, God must handle it. Um, and I believe that's what happened there is that it was a, a lesson to teach us that uh, no matter what your good intentions are or your, 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 your sincerity, uh, helping God with the law or trying to ho hold any part of the law or on your own shoulders is deadly. Um, and um, yeah, and another thing too, I, I guess I, what occurred to me is that the priests could touch these holy things. Well, we know that we're all priests. So the law, you know, the law just can't hurt us. So it was okay for the priests to touch these lawful things. Uh, but, um, again, for us as priests, the law can't hurt us, but a person who's not a priest, an unbeliever, uh, is, it will be hurt by it. Very good. Thank you. Some very interesting thoughts there. Um, let me see. I think everybody's answered, but me has so far. So, uh, hmm. Well, the, the thought that came to my mind, uh, you, of course, you do have Ananias and Sapphira as an example, but I, I'm thinking about Moses uh, when he struck the, the rock three times. Um, fortunately, God's ruling on that was not the death sentence for Moses, um, but um, it, he did uh, suffer a great uh, loss in that he, because of that. He, he would never be allowed to go into the promised land. So I'm sure that that was a great, horrible consequence for him making that mistake. Sure. But it's just a matter is that uh, someone said, that, I think with Lisa talked about uh, the fear of God and uh, that is this reverence that we must have. And that's why it really, it really bothers me when I hear people, um, mostly it's from non-Christians and non, probably just, atheists or secular humanist type people, but they, um, they, they'll they use God's name in vain just so casually. And and even the name Jesus, fortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, some of these people use the name Jesus more than some of the professing Christians. You know, a, a Christian in a conversation with someone, if God comes up, they'll say God, but they don't say Jesus, because Jesus is a name that causes division. And uh, so they avoid many, I think they're real Christians, but they know, even if it's just unconscious, they know if they say the name Jesus, that uh, they're going to suffer some kind of consequence for mentioning his name. So they'll just say God, like a generic God. But uh, the, the, the name of Jesus is... Uh, should be completely respected all the time. And when people throw his name around casually, particularly as part of a, you know, expressing their, their anger or cursing, uh, it, it's really, it, it sickens me, but I can't control whatever other people do. So I, I suffer through it if I hear it. But uh, and I think it, God is offended by these things. And this um, fear of God, uh, I've always been one of these people that wants to quickly correct that and, and tell everybody that this fear should be understood as respect and reverence. But uh, fear is not wrong, though. Fear, it's a healthy amount of fear that we really should should have. Uh, have you ever noticed that uh, our God uh, it, it, in the Bible, it's he's very liberal dishing out the death sentence to people. Uh, what you would think sometimes is, a minor offense, and yet it comes with a death penalty, capital punishment. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I uh, changed my mind on capital punishment years ago and thought that uh, um, ending someone's life was not unfair or, or a horrible thing to do. If God gave declared the death sentence and uh, capital punishment for a lot of things that most people today would be, think is well, uh, you know, too much of a penalty. But God, uh, for some reason, it's not that he doesn't value life, he does. Uh, but if, if someone has to be taken uh, by God um, for any of these things, if, they, if their life is taken, then um, they were given the opportunity to live a life. No one is owed an opportunity to even live. 
the fact that we even get to live, take our first breath, and as long as we live, whatever we're able to experience is, is a blessing to any person to even be able to have a life. Uh, so he, God's not obligated to let you continue living and living, especially through your, your insults uh, uh, for, for the one that made you. Um, uh, also, wasn't there a, something where the high priest, uh, it, it, when he had to go into the Holy of Holies, he uh, did he crawl in and have a rope tied to him so that uh, if he did something wrong, uh, it, it, it broke any of these little rules, they knew that he would die, he, he, he would be killed. So to get his body out, they always had a rope tied around him to pull him up because, because apparently some of these high priests, uh, when it was their turn to go into the Holy Holies, they, uh, they did something that was not exactly right, and they, their life was taken. Am, right. I, uh, am I giving a really accurate account of that or not? I'm not positive. Yeah. I thought you. that... Go ahead, Chris. No, you, you got there first. Go ahead. Um, I thought that... I thought I read that too, um, but I, Renee mentioned something about that a couple of weeks ago or days ago and said uh, it was a tradition. Uh, maybe a very true tradition, but I thought it was actually in the Bible, but I, I could be wrong. But yeah, they put bells on them, I think. Or maybe it was a rope or bells. Maybe one of those is a tradition. Uh, but they would they would know when if the guy fell over dead, essentially. And they would drag him out. Wow. All right, Crips, did you want to add more? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, that, he... he... He nailed it. I mean, that's that's all I was going to say was I, I it seems like I've heard that that, that that's true, but um, I'm fascinated now. So I'm going to have to go back in and try to find it. Yeah. Have you guys noticed that? What, what I said, though, that uh, um, there there are some people that uh, I've, I've called them closet Christians where uh, they want to keep their faith very private and personal. That's what they will explain. That it's, it's a personal thing. Yeah. Well, of course, we, we should. How could we even think of keeping it private and personal when we have this great gift? Uh, we should be in, in, you know, such joy all the time that we always want to talk about it and tell everybody. It should be our natural reaction. To, it's, it's like that story about getting the win in the, the publisher's clearinghouse. And they, they said, not only do you get $10 million today, when they knocked on my door, but they said, anybody you tell about this, they'll also get $10 million. Well, come on. If I know that all I got to do is tell somebody and then they can, they can also have $10 million. Don't you think I'm going to tell everybody? What kind of a person would you be if you just kept it personal and private? So, uh, but there are a lot of people that uh, for some reason, uh, if the subject of God does come up with the Bible, they might ag agree then to uh, acknowledge that they believe in a God, but to go a step further and use the name of Jesus, many people are afraid to even uh, say the name out loud just because they know that uh, there's going to be judgment coming on them from, from the world if they identify with Jesus. Have you noticed that? Oh, yeah. Well, that no, let's uh, let's say hi to Angel first here. Angel just came hey here. Guys. Hey guys, yeah. uh, I was in a mad dash to find a birthday present for Joel because it's really hard to shop for, and I got home pretty late. So it's good to be here, guys. Um, trying to catch up on what question you're on right now. Happy birthday to Joel! Oh, thank you. So, is that Jen? Yes. Hey. hey, Jen. Awesome. I'm so glad that you're on here now. I was wondering if you were going to ever come back on one of the panels because um, you were on True Story Live. Uh, he is, yeah, his birthday is tomorrow and I can't order stuff online because he'll see it. And so I have to find it in person and it's just way too hard. But uh, but yeah, I got him a dash cam. Don't tell. Um. One of those like, <laughs> yeah. Very, very cool. But uh, sorry, guys. I don't want to I don't want to interrupt anymore. Um I uh, I don't know if the questions in the chat, so I can catch up. Well, uh, when uh, when Uzzah uh, caught the the Ark and the Covenant and uh, he touched it and and uh, he died because the Lord took his life for touching it. Uh, do you think that that was unfair? Unfair. That no, was unfair. God was unfair um, taking his life. You know, I, I, I'm i not familiar enough to, to know whether or not I feel that he was a believer. 
Um, but uh, in general, um, when it comes to, no, I don't think God's ever unfair. <laughs> I don't ever, I, I, I don't actually think God's ever unfair. So, um, so many things that you see in the Old Testament that I used to think were totally unfair and unjustifiable. Every single one of them that I've, you know, uh, hunted down, I've, I, I, God has shown me at least a glimpse of his reasoning. And um, a lot of times, like, you know, those who were uh, 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 punished for, you know, for instance, picking up sticks on the Sabbath, um, I, I, I believe that uh, I don't think God would take somebody out over something like that unless uh, unless they, you know, were uh, it, it was such an important picture um, because the Old Testament was really all just uh, kind of like a Rosetta Stone or something. It's hard to like a, it's like a, a key, a legend on a map in a lot of ways for the rest of the principles in scripture. But um, but I could say uh, uh, kind of being caught off guard. Uh, no, I don't think that's ever unfair. So <laughs> certainly not. Certainly false. All right. Um, all right. Before we move on, does anybody respond? want to respond to the, the point that I made about um, have you noticed that some people who privately, they might admit to you that they're a Christian, but as, as a rule, they avoid identifying for, for some reason. Yes. Um, so I'm inside. No, I thought I was going to be a, a little, I'd say a little joke, and it was not even my joke. But, uh, well, Nicodemus is, is a picture of that, and he came uh, to Christ at night so he wouldn't be seen, and uh, he was the first Nick at night. Oh, wow. Uh, I wonder where good. that came from. Very good. <laughs> that, was like, that was like a Luke tear joke. No, oh, that was better. Than yes, it was. was. Yes, it was. <laughs> He's the only one that laughed. Yeah, I, that's what I'm hoping for that I can <laughs> tell a joke that good one day. Oh, hey. well. Now, um, along the same lines, you know, one thing that irks me: um, people that identify themselves as Christians, but will refer to—I guess maybe it's okay—but like they, they'll they'll refer to unbelievers as brothers almost like in a similar way because they're ashamed of the fact I would, it appears that they're ashamed of the fact that God makes very clear, you know, we're not brothers and sisters with unbelievers, not at least in the spirit, but it seems like they are kind of, they feel guilty about that. Um, and they don't like to exclude people. Same with a lot of people that want to identify themselves as Christians. It's like they don't want the conflict or the, you know, they don't want to feel like they're excluding anybody. Uh, once you know, especially if you're in a situation where the all you know, there's any philosophy being discussed. I mean, the ultimate end of the conversation is really, well, yes, I, I believe you're going to go uh, to hell if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe um, before it's too late. And some people are gets, you know, are so like shy about uh, even expressing their beliefs because of, of you know that ultimate you know, question if somebody were to ask, but I, you know, I, I think it's uh, our duty to tell them um, <laughs> what we believe and tell them, you know, what God says about unbelievers. And it doesn't mean we don't have to, you know, that be friends with them, you know, love them, care about them, but it does mean, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed of what it says about, uh, about who we are brothers and sisters with. And, um, and that yes, Christ is the only way. Yeah, that last point that uh, Christ is the only way, that ex the exclusive ex exclusivity of Jesus that, uh, is what offends most people. And, uh, oh, but yeah. to defend that, I, I, I've seen so many uh, famous um, pastors uh, come on the Larry King radio t talk show and be interviewed, and he would routinely ask every one of them, well, answer this question for us. What about the people who live somewhere in the world that's obscure and no, you know, they never get a chance to learn about Jesus? Are, are they going to go to hell? And uh, uh, everybody, Bill, Billy Graham, Joel Osteen, uh, uh, the, the, all the others I've heard, and they will all hem-haw around and try to not answer the question directly and, and uh, uh, really basically say, well, only who knows what God's going to do and that um, maybe there's many ways to dig up to heaven. And But uh, it may surprise you. The only one I saw ans answer the question to my satisfaction was, um, what's the guy that wrote that book, The Purpose Driven Life? What's his name? Warren. 
Yeah, Rick Warren. He he defended the the, the fact that uh, Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me." So to me, Larry King, he said that that settles it. Jesus is the only way. Yeah, and he would. That's the we need to take a strong stand on that because that's really one of the most important tenets of uh, of Christianity is that uh, everybody needs Jesus. There's no other way. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. Uh, anybody will, if want to say more about this before we go to the next question? Did Jen answer the question? Yeah, I did. And I forgot okay. to say certainly false. And I did want to say I, I found uh, a write-up that said that the rope was to pull the priests out if they died. Mm -hmm. And the bells were put on them so that the people outside the tent could hear if they fell. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Interesting. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I thought, uh, I noticed in the chat room, Heather also confirmed that. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, okay, so I'm not imagining things. But, you know, when I was, uh, for years, I used to tell this account about, uh, in my childhood, I remember when we had a pet chimpanzee. And uh, he became just uh, too much of a trouble. And my, my father decided we had to give him, get rid of him. So we gave him to the San Diego Zoo. We donated him. And I told that story for years uh, into my, you know, 30s or 30 years old or 40 years old. And my younger sister overheard me saying that to telling somebody that once she said, what are you talking about? What are you, you is that a joke or something? I, and I was serious, but uh, she said, no, that never happened. Are you imagining that? But uh, I forgot why I say that. What, what were you talking about that made me say that? But, uh, about the bells and ropes, I would assume. Was it putting the bells and ropes on them? Oh, I don't remember why I said it, but uh, there are there are things though that uh, we we hear through. Oh yeah, it was like was I imagining the fact that this this account that the the high priest if he if he dies they have to pull him out because then there's a rope around it because nobody else can go in there. Was I imagining that? I could or did I hear that somewhere or is it in the Bible? Because I couldn't remember if it's directly in the Bible or extra biblical. All right. Enough of that. No, you weren't imagining it. It was the Mandela effect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I know what the Mandela effect is. Wow. Good. I have it. Either that or you had it. Uh, What's that thing where you do something again, something do? Deja vu. Deja vu, yeah. Yeah, I have experienced deja vus, but I, I, not the Mandela effect, though. All right, Ben, are you ready for the next question? Yes. It could be that you just read too many Curious George books as a kid. <laughs> yeah. All right, here's the next one. Um, true or false? God wanted... Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of life. He wanted them to eat from the tree of life. Yeah, okay. he wanted it. God wanted them, Adam and Eve, to eat, to eat from the tree of life. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I I was reading that wrong in my own head. Um, yeah, I, I put the emphasis on the wrong terms. I think. Um, yeah, true or false? God wanted Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of life, not from the tree of good and evil. Yeah. He wanted them to. He actually wanted them to eat from the tree of life. Yeah, until they. Oh, sorry, I'm answering out of turn. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you. Uh, you're not out of turn. Go ahead. It's your turn now. Uh, I, I it doesn't say specifically that he wanted them to eat it, but they had permission to eat it up until the time in which they sinned, and then that was one of the reasons they're cast out of the garden, unless they eat from the tree of life, and then. Uh, uh, God would have been, uh, I don't know how it would have been prevented, but uh, apparently to go by the rules. Um, if a person sins and then they eat from the tree of life and live forever, then uh, they, they never die, and that would uh, have caused issues for the plan of salvation for sure. Um, that's my understanding of why they're kicked out, but yeah, uh. I feel like God wanted them to eat from all the stuff he provided, except the one that he mentioned, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that. But all the other ones, yeah, I like, have at it, you know. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how he would not want them to eat from it 
when he gave them permission to eat from it and uh, and provided it for them. So, yeah, that's my answer. All right. Um, I I don't remember the, um, the exact details. There's a lot of times it's important to, when, when we do a Bible study that we go have the scriptures right in front of us and we can read everything carefully and look at the context and make sure we got it just right. And we're not, uh, unless we do that tonight, I don't think we can expect to get, maybe get it all exactly right. Um, I don't remember anything about uh, God saying they had permission to eat it unless it, it's just uh, he had they had permission to eat everything except that one tree. I guess we'd conclude that they had permission, but I don't think it was explicitly stated that they have permission to eat from the tree of life. Um, and if you do eat from the tree of life and you get eternal life, um, then uh, does that mean that God could not end your life? I mean, does that mean that God is no longer in, uh, in, uh, uh, omni, omnipotent? You know, is not all powerful. Does God no longer have the ability to end their life because they have uh, uh, eaten from the tree of uh, life? Um, I don't know, but I answered it leaning true um, because uh, I'm just taking a, a guess just based on my over, overall thoughts on it, but I don't have any real details to support, support it. So, all right, who wants to go next? I go next. Um, I said certainly true. Actually, I got to go answer it, but that's what my answer is. Yeah. Um, because as I just wrote, where did it disappear in the chat? Oh, darn it! <laughs> it goes by so fast. Uh, Genesis two sixteen, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree yeah. of the garden." Yeah. Thou mayest freely eat, right? Mm -hmm. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that means every other tree was included, which would mean the tree of life was included. Mm -hmm. So he did want them to eat from it. He said they could, mm -hmm. but they didn't. <laughs> they, they, uh, as we know, as the story goes, they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it was there. It was purpose for them to, to eat. He told them they could, but it wasn't even on the radar screen <laughs> for right. some reason, you know. And uh, I think, I don't know, this would be just 100% supposition. In the same way that I think we experience that blindness that the devil is able to bring, where he blinds you to something that can be right in front of your face. Yes. I don't know if he was able to do that to them, uh, but I I'm inclined to believe that he just blinded them to even consider the tree of life. Not It wasn't even a thought, according to scripture, in their minds to consider the tree of life. And that, that, that to me has always been fascinating. Why, why didn't they home? Why didn't they go, what about this tree over here? <laughs> you know, why wasn't it? And I think, I don't know, it, it maybe the even put some kind of um, uh, charm or uh, how was it, you know, brilliance to the tree? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he even was hanging from it when he spoke to her. I don't know, you know, as, as the serpent. Because you'll see that depiction. I've seen artists do depictions like that where the woman is standing there and the serpent is actually hanging from like one of the branches of the tree talking to her. So I don't know, but it's just it's just interesting to consider that that the tree of life wasn't even on the radar screen, but the the tree that he expressly told them not to is the one that the, the woman we know was interested in. And then later the husband partook. So, you know, I don't know, but that would be my answer. Yeah, he did want them to certainly. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to revise my answer a little bit, thinking a little bit more about this instead of, leaning true i'm going to say undecided but uh i'm thinking that if god is omniscient and it does, the bible does say that uh the cross and the plan of salvation that this was all set out uh, before the foundations of the world mm -hmm. and so um obviously god knew in advance how it was going to play out that they would eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil there would be a fall and everything that's happens until throughout 
eternity. So if if God knows all that, then uh, I don't know how I could think that he wanted them to do something different. It's, it's all part of the plan and, and his foreknowledge. All right, uh, let's, let's ask uh, Sister Jen, what's your answer? Um, my answer is, well, was certainly true. <laughs> <laughs> my brain, I've got all my gears turning now. I'm like, hmm, I already submitted it though. Um, just because the scripture says they were permitted to eat of every tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. That's what mine is based off of. But Genesis 3.22 is an interesting scripture. It says, then the Lord said, God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he, now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat. And live forever. And it's kind of like a dot, dot, dot. And then 23 is, therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of, of Eden to work the ground from. Mm -hmm. um, so the one sentence following the first one, I'm like, what does that mean? Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So it makes me think, I mean, had they already eaten from it? Or is he saying that? If he, if they reached out and, and ate of the tree of life, would have changed the outcome of him kicking them out. I don't know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not very curious. So it was certainly true, but now I'm kind of undecided as to if they actually ate from it prior, or yeah. if they always had the ability to eat from it. They just hadn't yet. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but no, it does. It yeah. Does. yeah. Okay. Um, well, so yeah, I'm undecided. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I keep thinking of more to add, but uh, I really, uh, I, I think I have to take this back to uh, the I concept of God being love, um, and that's proof of the Trinity, in that if there's, in order for love to exist, there has to be a lover and an object, and, and so that means that God has to be uh, at least by, if not a triune, and so, um, but this idea of love is that's what's behind the creation anyway god wants a loving relationship with us since love can't exist without free will and ability to not love someone um then uh, that god had to give us all free will and in order to uh, there had with free will it was inevitable that there would be this fall but then people would all be given a uh, the ability to love Jesus or reject Jesus. And so you, it's a free will, uh, uh, rather than love being imposed on us, uh, you can't do it, it wouldn't be love then. So I think it was all necessary that it happened exactly the way it did. Otherwise, God could have never satisfied this, uh, what his real uh, desire was, is to make us a, a loving relationship between us. All right, uh, let me see. Who hasn't gone yet? I, I have. I, think, um, I, I don't have too much to add because that been, I've been through uh, a change of mind twice now. Um, so I'm just going to say undecided because at first I was going to say certainly true because obviously the, the tree of life was permitted for them to eat. But then you started bringing up the question of what did God ultimately want? Did God want me to fall? You know, and... Um, and I'm undecided on that. It's hard to, because part of me thinks God it, it would have liked for that not to have been necessary in order for, like, uh, what I, I believe that it's, um, that all of this was a trust exercise for us to spend eternity with God, having freely chosen, you know, of our, our, of our volition uh, to, uh, to love him and honor him as our God so that it wasn't just this weird narcissistic psychodrama where he created a bunch of us who never had any choice but to worship him and, you know, ultimately weren't even really that happy about it, you know, spending eternity worshiping him as our best case scenario. I think God wanted it to be a real, uh, like, love story, love relationship, and the best way to uh, to deserve the kind of trust that is involved with uh, with somebody being your God for all eternity. Um, um, you know, the best way to, to demonstrate to us would be to be become like us and to die for us. Uh, mm -hmm. That's honestly, I believe that's, I mean, what, what better character witness can you, can you imagine? Um, and so it's hard, though, to, to, to ask the question whether God, you know, wanted us to fall. 
you know, because like I, I would like to think ultimately that he he wished it, there could have been another way to make it a valid, true, like uh, voluntary relationship. You see what I'm saying? So that people wouldn't have yeah. to be lost. So yeah. um, it's, it's hard to it's really hard to, to say one way or the other. But uh, I do. You know, obviously, I do think because he knew that there would be no real way to have a have a true but genuine relationship with us for eternity where he wasn't really just holding us hostage. Like I thought when I was a little kid, which is why I rejected God. It sounded like a hostage situation to me. Yeah. Being heaven. And um, uh, I think, you know, short of, short of the fact that it would be impossible for him to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to earn this, this relationship, you know, really, cause that's what I think all of the Bible is, you know, it's not, it's, we're not in, you know, in salvation, it's not us earning anything from God. It's him earning our trust and um and so you know i'll I'll, sorry ultimately i do think that uh yes because he knew that some would have to fall uh that he did want us to uh to go through with it because it was necessary for the uh for the greater good in the end but uh uh, still a little bit undecided because it's it's really kind of makes my head spin to think about you know it's kind of like time travel or something in a weird way (laughs) like all these (laughs) so that was beautifully said, though, Angel. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I I think about it a lot trying to explain it to unbelievers, you know, because I remember myself thinking, well, what a jerk, you know, but it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. opposite. Yeah, it's amazing. I, this is the first question where I've actually th- answered it three times. <laughs> I, <laughs> I changed my mind twice. Uh, amazing. Thank you, Heather. That was a great question. Uh, any more before we go to the next one? Anyone? All right. Now that my mind is twisted into a pretzel, let's move forward. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I haven't answered that one yet. Um, oh, Ben. Sorry. Sorry. It's not a big deal. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I, this, it's got my, like Jen said, this has got my gears turning too. And, and I, I for, forgive me if I'm a little more scattered than usual on this. Um, but Jen said also too, that, um, they said that lest he eat, they eat from it, dot, 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 and live forever. I'm sorry, live forever, dot, dot, dot. And I always kind of took that as like, God was like, didn't even want to, he want, he didn't even want to complete the sentence or think that thought anymore because it was so uh, tragic to him so unthinkable that he would lose his relationship with mankind it's like he just stopped his thought in midstream almost but um we did one thing we did learn from that is by that statement is that uh yes if they had eaten from it um even before the fall they would have lived for forever um but i also know that i think that before god even did any before god even spoke a single thing into existence he had this whole thing planned out from, from beginning to end and you see that throughout the Bible where, um, like, for example, the flood, the flood was uh, the, the windows of heaven were opened up and the, and the uh, fountains of the great deep were opened up. They were he- those waters were held held in reserve because he knew what was going to happen. Just so where, as Peter says, um, where he talks about the flood as well, he says that the current present age that we're in now, it's the world we're in now, it's, it's reserved for fire. So it, the God's already got that fire reserved. It's ready to be unleashed at any moment when the time is right. Uh, just like uh, also, too, is that heaven and he- uh, the lake of fire is reserved for the devil and his angels. So these things are in place before they, they're even needed uh, or put, you know, there's no no one in. Uh, I don't believe there's anything in the lake of fire right now. Um, and also, too, Peter talks about where you you have a reservation in heaven. You're, you're, you have an inheritance. It's reserved for you. So um, so in the same way, I mentioned that because I believe uh, there was, a you know, a, 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 the tree of good and evil. Uh, and the tree of life in the middle of the garden, and um, the the tree of good and evil is a picture of the law, and the law looks good to us. It, you know, people want to festoon themselves with the trappings of the law. You know, I've I've got this. You know, all their little Cub Scout badges or whatever. You know, merit badges. Um, and in fact, I this is kind of interesting. I just thought about this: is that um, I, I, there's a story in the Old Testament where Joshua and and uh, God tells uh, Achan. Uh, when they conquered the land, you're not you're not supposed to take anything that's anathema. And he calls out what's anathema, like, and the anathema are the goods of that land, of certain lands. And, and the and the thing that he was specifically called out, or Achan took, 
was Babylonian armor. So shiny Babylonian armor, you know, makes you look good and makes you stand out in front of other, for other people. If you think about Satan had a bunch of, he was bejeweled uh, with all kinds of fancy things. The high priest of the law, he was bejeweled. He looked fancy. He, he had a great appearance. Um, and uh, I forgot where I was going with that already, so forgive me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, it, it looks good, okay? So, oh, yeah, the, the thing I was going to say about Achan, when he took the armor, it, it used the same terminology, basically the same formula that Eve, when she took it, because it said that Achan saw it, he coveted it, and then he took it. So, you know, he saw it, had, the desire came about, and then he then he took what wasn't supposed to be his. Um, and so uh, I think that the the fruit of the tree, good and evil, it was the the the... The, it said the fruit was pleasant to the eye, just like the law is. It's pleasant to the eye. The, the Jews walk by sight. You know, it, it was pleasant to the eye. But I believe Christ is a picture of the tree of life. And what did the what did Christ look like? Well, it says in Isaiah that he had no splendor or coveliness. There was nothing that that we would that they would see in him that they should desire him. You know, and then uh, Christ also likened his body. To the fruit of the tree of life, essentially, because he says, "Whoever eats my blood drinks my eats my flesh and drinks my blood." Again, that's part of eating. And so I believe what again, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, where they they saw the tree of good of the tree of life, but it wasn't it didn't stand out. But the, but it, right next to it was the tr the law, the tree of law, and they saw that and said, "Oh, that it, it promised them uh, it was promising for wisdom. It was good for wisdom, and it was going to make them like gods." Well, those are two things they didn't have. And they probably thought with well, the tree of life, we talk about life. We already have life. You know, why, why do I eat tree of life? I don't, you want to <laughs> eat that old, that, that, you know, probably with a, looked like a rotten, uh, not a rotten, but probably looked like a, like a raisin or something. I don't know. It, it didn't look so good to eat. And so uh, I think they were drawn to definitely to the, to the, by appearance, to the, to the law, uh, to the picture of, you know, Satan, Satan lied to them. And they probably already thought they had life, just like unbelievers today. They think, oh, no, I don't need the gospel. I already have life. I already have righteousness. I, I'm perfectly righteous. I don't need anyone's righteousness. And, and so I saw a lot of parallels there. Um, but ultimately, yes, God hates all disobedience. And, um, you know, what is sin uh, is against his will. And um, it's opposed to uh, – so again, yeah, I, I get the, again everything God foreknew. He knew it was going to happen. I believe it was God's ultimate plan to deal with evil. So he knew it from the beginning. Uh, it was it was a way for, for God to justly condemn Satan and put away evil forever. So it, it's not like evil can't, didn't exist. If, there, if evil didn't exist, uh, I, goodness really couldn't exist, um, or that it wouldn't be uh, seen as good. I guess. Um, and so I think it's God's ultimate plan for condemning Satan, condemning sin, and doing away with sin forever. And that's that's a wonderful thing. Amen. Hmm. I think it's funny how they, he tempted him with something that to me seems not as cool. <laughs> like I'm, I'm thinking if I had to choose between life and the knowledge of good and evil, I would choose life. But I do think it's also interesting and fascinating that the very thing that Satan thought was going to be their downfall, it opened up this whole um, process of, of death and being reconciled to God um, Amen. Same was shattered with, with Christ dying on the cross. Many people were really, really upset and grieving, but it was, it was a part of God's plan. Um, so Satan in a way kind of played right into his hands. <laughs> ha ha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, ben, your premise about uh, this appeal of the the tree of knowledge i hadn't really thought about it like that before uh i was wondering how many people uh if 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 they weren't familiar with anything in the history of all these accounts in the bible but that they were just in this situation where they were given this choice this tree or that tree what do you think would appeal to most people would would they would they be interested in, in uh, life or or would there ego and pride wanting to be like god and know right and wrong and the knowledge have knowledge would that would that appeal but look that's what satan went for lucifer yeah that's a great question and i think that he made us curious and i think he he made us want to 
to know things. I mean, gosh, I mean, I remember growing up and asking my dad so many questions. He'd say, don't ask me any more questions. <laughs> you know, the, you know, thanks for coming by, but uh, I'm, I'm tired. Leave me alone. Um, I was born, as I think most children are born with curiosity. They want to learn things. They want to, um, to know more. Uh, and I think that's something God instilled in us. Um, but he wants us to obey. So uh, he made us with curiosity, but he wanted us to willingly uh, uh, obey him. So um, it doesn't mean that he's evil because he, uh, he created us with the very thing that eventually led us to sin. That's, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that, it, that that's his fault. It's our fault. Um, but he did create us that way, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of our makeup. So it's interesting either way. All right. Uh, everybody answered that question, right? Yep. Yes. I would like to read, go back and read the comments from the last question that I forgot about. And then the comments for this one, if you don't mind at some right. point. Thank you. Go ahead and do it now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. For this question, we got four responses and the, someone says Jesus is the tree of life. Um, another person says he promises the give us the tree of life, but they did it before they the appointed time. Who know what would have happened if they had been obedient to his word? Um, uh, the other distinction too, I, I thought I, I wanted to make, I forgot to, was that um, I think part of the understanding that that thing that that is, that whole episode was that Adam and Eve were not righteous before they fell; they were innocent, and the law. The, you know, they, they were not righteous. They were innocent. And the law defines what uh, what's uh, righteous or not righteous. And because there's only one law they had, uh, in fact, they desired, I believe it was a sin for them to uh, desire the to, to have what God hadn't bestowed upon them, uh, or, you know, knowledge of good and evil. They thought that, oh, God was withholding something from them. Um, so that tells me right there that they, you know, again, they were innocent but not righteous. And that's why I think it's important to understand that God gives us his righteousness because if he just merely restored us to, uh, to innocence again, well, we were surely uh, a sin again. Um, and, uh, but you know, we get to be righteous as he is. So I think that's a, an important uh, distinction. Um, okay. Heather B says they were told they could from every tree in the garden, but not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Some people believe that Jesus was the tree of life. I believe he was representation personally. Um, uh, for sure. Uh, and then someone says Revelation 22. And then for the last uh, question, the comments were, and that was the one referring to Uza and his uh, uh, trying to help God out with the burdens of the law. Um, that is, someone says, is it impossible for God to be unfair? Uh, another person says, God is never unfair. Uh, a third person says, like the man who was stoned to death in Joshua's time, like the beginning of chapter Beginning chapters of Romans, it's an example of the law showing we are guilty and slain by it and to point us to the grace of God through Jesus. Another person says, certainly false. Uzzah unrighteously did not treat the ark as holy as God intended, but carelessly put it in the cart as the oxen shook it. Mm -hmm. uh, Second Samuel 6, 3, uh, 6 to 7. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of the of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ahio, uh, the sons of Abinadab, drave, drove the new cart. I'm trying to do some spelling errors here. So, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark. Again, I think it's important to note that God said beforehand, no one but the priest should touch the holy things. And I believe, again, Uzzah is a picture of someone with good intentions, but trying to help God with the burdens of the law is deadly. I think that's the, the lesson there. Um, and then Heather B says, Uzzah didn't trip the mule tripped. Exactly. God gave specific instructions to how the ark was to be moved, and David ignored those instructions. The ark was to be carried by poles, not on a cart. If they were carrying it by the poles, it would not have fallen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Excellent comments. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Angel, you're back. Did you get it? You answered this second question, didn't you? 
Yes, she did. Angel yes, did? I did. Okay. All right, then. So let's go to the next question, Ben. Okay. True or false? True or false? You are required to know that Jesus' death paid the penalty for everyone's sins to be saved. Okay. Let's start with Sister Lisa. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, know if that statement is true. I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but I know that you have to understand that he paid for your sin. I don't know why anybody would presume it's your sin versus anybody else's that I, I don't even know why anybody would extrapolate that because we're walking around today. Everybody teaches that he's paid for everyone's sin, which is why you can preach the gospel to everyone. So that's a little strange question. Um, yeah, more. You dropped, out. you dropped out, Lisa. Lisa, you still uh, talking, or did you lose the sound? All right, let's let's have uh, Sister Angel. Why don't you go next? Well, I'm really glad we got this question because I have struggled with this question a lot because of the fact that, you know, um, not all Calvinists, for instance, believe all exactly the same, you know, points of Calvinism. And some, uh, you know, uh, do believe the, the limited atonement, but for instance, might reject um, the perseverance of the saints. Um, and I always wonder about that, like how, like, you know, is the limited atonement, uh, you know, damnable to the point of, you know, that these people aren't saved. And I am undecided. I really don't know. Um, because it is, it seems, it seems that, you know, <laughs> there's no clear way to answer it because I do believe that people need to understand that Christ, you know, paid for your sins, you know, personally, that you, because of what Christ did, that you are washed clean. But um, I'm not sure how much, Beyond that is, you know, required uh, how much, how, what, you know, and salvific, you know, it seems very personal, but then again, uh, you know, I, I, there are, some would argue that the, the limited atonement changes the gospel to the point that it's not the same Jesus. Um, I, and so I'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts, because this is one of those questions that really eats me up. And, you know, uh, I, I've, you know, puzzled over for maybe two or three years now, and I still don't know the answer. All right, thank you. I'd like to go next. Uh, well, I'll answer it about that particular point, but I'll, ex I'll expand it to other things. That uh, I, I believe that uh, a person is not required to know and understand and believe a whole lot. Um, the more things that we put on a list and say, here's two points, three points, 10 points, 20 points. The more things we put on that list that we require people to agree to and understand, uh, it, it eventually what we're doing is become, it's a form of theological legalism where you, you need to get all your theological points to, just right uh, before it's possible to get saved. I, I think that uh, it's easy to get saved. And I think that uh, God wants it to be easy. I think God is eager to save so God is not going to be some kind of legalist and dogmatist about exactly how we do it. I think what God wants us to understand is just simply that um, we need Jesus. No one else but Jesus can, can give us eternal life. And, and we, we need to receive it from Jesus as a gift. And, and that uh, he accomplished it. He can give it to us because he did pay for all our sins on the cross. So the sin problem's resolved, and the and the death problem is resolved. And in other words, we're all born sinners. Well, Jesus paid for my sin. We're all going to die. Jesus gives me eternal life. So if a person understands that uh, Jesus uh, guarantees me eternal life, and I can have it because He paid for all my sins on the cross, I wouldn't uh, re impose any more than that on someone as far as their testimony that I would be satisfied. Uh, that they understand the gospel. Um, but the idea of believing that he paid for everybody's sins 
uh, that would not disqualify someone in my mind, and, and that, that I would I could take that probably to um, yeah, any of the points of, of Calvinism, except for I would say the perseverance of the saints is the is the problem, um, as far as the gospel is concerned. I, I hate every element of of uh, Calvinism, all five points of tulip, and the foundational principle of no free will. Uh, I hate it all. But if a person uh, believes all those things, that does not disqualify them from getting saved, in my opinion. That they, if they understand and believe the, the, the things I just stated, uh, that's going to be enough. I'm not going to say that they, can't, they never got saved or they couldn't be saved uh, unless they understand all these other, what, what I would call, fine points, fine theological points. Otherwise, we're requiring people to really become theologians in order to get saved. Yeah. All right. Um, who wants to go next? Uh, I'll go next. I, I, I put leaning false. Um, I uh, thought what you said was uh, pretty profound, Brother Luke, and uh, I probably don't hate Calvinism as much as you do, but the, I think the part that you hate, I think we agree on that. Um, when you're setting up rules for other people and saying, well, I'm going because I'm chosen and you're not, and God chooses people to go to hell, that's absolutely uh, false, certainly false. If that was the question, I would answer false. Um, but if someone does not have the full understanding of whether Jesus' death paid for uh, only certain people, in other words, the way that they believe that it's only for those prede predestined, um, I mean, in a way, the, the, the problem with Calvinism, in my opinion, is that there are some things that they're correct about. Uh, and many things they're not correct about. The way they gather the information and the conclusions they come to are incorrect, uh, though there is some truth to some of the things that they believe. So it's difficult to uh, parcel out uh, what's, sometimes difficult to parcel out what's correct and what's incorrect. But that's the same about other religions. Matthias and I talked about this the other day, uh, this very thing, and uh, Catholics believe certain things, and they believe in the Trinity. Uh, I don't agree with most everything else they believe, but hey, they got that one right. Seventh Day Adventist, uh, they they have uh, uh, some beliefs that I believe to be correct. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm a Seventh Day Adventist, but I certainly um, agree with the things that I I believe are are supported by Scripture. Not everything that they believe, though. Um, I don't know what the Jehovah's Witnesses are correct about. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Jen, you ready? You ready to go? Yeah, this is a little bit of a brain twister. Um, I am leaning false because I don't think it's required. And this is an interesting question because I'm I'm trying to think. Okay, required for salvation? Required for what? Just in general. <laughs> um, but I'm leaning false because I do think it's important for us to believe it for ourselves. We can't believe for other people. But on the other hand. You know, if you're going out and making disciples, if you're going out and sharing the gospel, I do think there's some importance in other people believing that they, that they too, and for us as well, to know that God died for other, you know, for other people's sins as well. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a brain twister, but I like it. I like my brain being twisted. I know you do. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, let me see. I, Lisa, or did you? Yeah. Go Go ahead. I went, but I got interrupted. I'm sorry about yeah. that. My, my phone yeah. disconnected. Uh, yeah. I was I was on my rant, and then you uh, were on your rant. Just really, I right. was I was doing so well too. You were <laughs> I was right there with you. Okay, I'm gonna do a reversal because I think I actually said leaning true, but uh, after hearing some of the answers, because like I said, I need a little to think about a little more. Um, I'm gonna say leaning false because Brother Luke laid out his case so wonderfully. Wonderful. Brother Luke, you got it right again, I think, which is that uh, the gospel is, is simple and plain and a little child can understand it. And they don't you don't have to know all the particulars and all the details. You just need to know the facts, the basic facts. And <clears throat> that's why I'm saying when you're preaching, when you're, if, if somebody hears the gospel, it's kind of almost an under, understanding uh, how they say a gimme. It just comes with it. That is for everyone. How else could they be preaching it to you? So I'm not, I, I'm going to say that uh, it's, uh, it's, 
I'm going to say cert actually certainly false because there's uh, – my mother and I were talking about this just a few weeks ago that – and and she was an adult when when she got saved. So I asked her. I said, "Mama, this is what happened to me, even as a child, when I heard and understood the gospel. And I want to know, did this happen to you, where you had this flash at the moment that you comprehended the gospel and you understood it, and you said in in your mind, I believe that there was this instant flash that happened before you made the decision." That was like a download, like your, you know how people talk yes. about your life flashes mm -hmm. and it's like all the things it, I don't know if it's, if it's just the dismissal of all the arguments that the devil could possibly even throw at you, uh, like the quit smoking, the quit this, the quit that, or what you're going to have to give up all of that just kind of flash. And, and, and it, it's like when Jesus said, except that you, you know, you, you're willing to give up all these other things for me. In that flash, in that moment, even though you didn't decompress it all and sort it all out and get the whole page by page, in that instant download, you understood whatever it is for Jesus that I need, I want it. I want Jesus. I don't care about all this other stuff. In that moment, that person makes that decision. And the, so all of these other things, like the nuance of this, did, that is for the whole world, uh, whether or not the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is for the day. All that other stuff is stuff you begin to unpack after the fact. But in that moment, you say, I want Jesus. And and so I'm going to say that it's, it's false because the only thing they have to believe is that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected as the payment for their sin at that moment that they believe. They don't have to worry about anybody else. That's not their concern. So I, I'm going to say... It is certainly false. Mm. All right. Amen. Amen. All right. Sister Angel. Oh, I already answered. Uh, I said I was uh, that I was undecided, but I am glad to hear everybody's uh, answers because I think I was just afraid to say what I felt, which I really felt that it wasn't prior so false, but I wasn't confident enough uh, in my own, you know, hunch that really that that's not uh you know, that that really is over complicating the gospel um so so i think that i have uh changed my answer a bit but uh it's it's really awesome to hear you guys uh, talk about this all right thank you uh sister jen did you answer yeah i did okay so we're only lacking ben i think right ben uh yeah i haven't done gone Go okay go um, ahead. Go ahead, ben. I, I would say no i would say no uh but uh usually and I'm not saying 100% of the time, uh, and I'm saying no. I'm saying no as a as a blanket statement. But I would say usually it's indicative of an underlying uh, un false teaching and uh, uh, it's something more uh, sinister in terms of in terms of their false understanding. Um, not always. I mean, again, but usually people that hold to that kind of thing, like like I think uh, a Calvinist would. They, I think John MacArthur, for example, he holds to it. And when there's one error. It leads all all kinds of other errors, and I think he teaches his most of his teaching is full of errors, and so I think it's indicative of something, a symptomatic of something uh, that's not properly understood, and there's some false doctrine, and it, you know I think it's fine if someone holds it for a little bit, and you know I don't think it's a salvation issue, but um, if someone persists in it forever, you know, or, you know, or just dogmatic against it, um, and re I, I really question like, do you really believe? Have you, have you really thought these things out? Do you under not understand? The absolute righteous righteousness of God, and that that only a perfect His perfect righteousness, um, no, that no one's righteous first of all, and that uh, and that He would ha He would have had to uh, uh, died for everyone to make the gift available to everyone. Um, and again, the this kind of false teaching, like Calvinism uh, or any or any form of Calvinism, you know, if they accept any the 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 foundation of it uh, or the tenets of it. Um, the um uh, it's all i i think it's really kind of a, a self-centered and very narcissistic way of looking at uh the christian life like there's something god, that god saw something in them that's special that no one else has uh or there's some cause in them that god said oh you're special i'm gonna die for you but not anyone else um it's it's a very self-centered way of looking at scripture and anyone who reads the bible knows the bible has got nothing to do with you it's all about christ 
The whole Bible is his story. So uh, I think it says a lot about, about the heart, really, if, if someone persists in it for a long time. But again, I don't think it's a salvation issue. Amen. Um, well, I, I'll give you as quickly as I can the, the each of these points that and why I don't think the only the fifth point of uh, tulip is is the big problem. Uh, total depravity is means that a man uh, is not able to believe, um, and that uh, God has to impose belief on them. Uh, if, now I, that's horrible. It's, I think it's evil philosophy. Uh, but um, if, if a person believes, it doesn't matter if they think that God made them believe or they somehow came, came to believe. It, it, the result is they still believe. So I wouldn't disqualify them for that. Uh, unconditional election, uh, well, the condition is you got to believe. We know that. But they say, no, God, first he re regenerates you. He he comes, enters you, regenerates you with the spirit, and now you can believe. So um, whether, whichever way it is, uh, it's still, if they believe, then they're still saved. I don't, I don't really see why that would disqualify someone. And limited atonement, if a person believes that Jesus paid for their sins, that's enough. Uh, if they think that he paid for the sins of everybody who ever gets, gets saved, um, that's great. I believe that's true. If they don't believe that they he paid for the sins of the whole world, but only the saved people, that does not disqualify him, in my opinion. I don't think that qualifies, as, as some people would say, this is a different Jesus. No, it's just they believe that Jesus uh, and his propitiation is different. That it's not as all-encompassing. I believe he paid for the sins of the whole world, even the unbeliever sins he paid for. Yeah. Uh, and then irresistible, uh, well, I don't know if I could resist it. And God, once I understood God's grace, uh, it was irresistible to me. But does that mean that I, I think God does resist? A man does resist it. We resist God all the time. Many people throughout their whole life that continue re resisting Him. And but the perseverance um, uh, in good works and and in the faith, this is where Calvinism becomes um, lordship and a works based system. And that's why that final point. Is, is is what uh, disqualifies a Calvinist. If they do believe that uh, a person has to continue in good works, they cannot ever uh, backslide into sin, or they could never have a crisis of faith, then they are, uh, uh, that those are tenets of that last point of Calvinism, and those things they are turned into a, a, a work system where you've got to either persist in your faith and persist in good works, but we know that you don't have to persist because God preserves us. It should be understood as preservation of the saints. God keeps us saved no matter what. All right. Uh, anybody want to respond to any of those points? I would say amen to that, Luke. All right. I'll 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 say ditto to, to, to Ben's amen. All right. So indirectly, I got an amen from you. You did. I'll, in fact, I'll, I'll give you a real one. Amen. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy to get all the amens I can. Yes, Let's get high on the most high, Jesus. <laughs> all right. Okay, anything else, guys? Should we go to the next question now? Sure. All right, Ben, what is it? We got to slow down. I already got two more left. Uh, I, can, I, I have more. I can get more ready. I got another log I can throw on, but uh, I wasn't, wasn't expecting to. Um, okay, next question is... True or false? I think all these might be uh, Heather's, actually. <laughs> uh, they're, they're good. Um, true or false? When God promises in Psalm 37.4 to grant us the desires of our hearts, he is promising prosperity on earth. Can I go first? Yeah, please. No, do. me, no, me. Okay, go ahead. No, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> Certainly false. I, I don't even have to think about this one. Certainly false. Um, I've I've had uh, discussions with people that believe prosperity doctrine, more than one. In fact, I had some people that I had been fellowshipping with uh, going out to uh, breakfast um, at least one morning a month for a while. And if I hadn't done that, I would not have even known 
that they were heavy prosperity uh, doctrine people. I mean, some of the conversations we had before that were wonderful and amazing and uplifting and, uh, you know, Christ crucified and risen and, and everything was, was uh, tip top. Um, and and uh, after a few weeks of meeting with them and stuff, uh, it came up in conversation when uh, the, one of the gentlemen who he calls himself a, an evangelist and uh, has a, um, uh, a show on blog talk. Now, I cared very much about these people. The woman I'd probably known for 15 years, she was a uh, secretary to my uh, chiropractor. Um, dear, dear woman. We, and I loved going in there because every time I go in there, we talk about the Lord. And I would look forward to seeing her. But then I come to find out because he mentioned, um, who's the guy that blew, that blew uh, COVID out with his breath? Um, I'm being facetious, but. Uh, I can't. I can't recall the. Oh uh, gosh, I know who you're talking about, and I can't Copeland. think of his oh, name. Kenneth Copeland. Yes. He, he invoked the name of Kenneth Copeland in a positive way. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, Kenneth Copeland. You're kidding, right? I thought he was kidding at first, but he wasn't. Uh, so certainly false. It is a false doctrine. It is a false belief. And all we have to do is look at the the early church who uh, did not prosper in physical terms, did not have huge homes. I mean, some of them did maybe, but overall um, they, they faced uh, violent deaths, many of them, and were persecuted um, unless someone else on the panel or in the chat considers that prosperity. Uh, I, I don't, and I don't expect it in this life. Um, I think, I think that scripture is about uh, 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 it's a future promise. It's a uh, promise for the the future with the new heavens and new earth, and I believe it. I believe it a hundred percent. He says that he's going to um, uh, do anything. I believe it. Uh, I have faith in it. So that's my answer. Okay, Jen, did you want to go next? I just wanted to say enthusiastically. <laughs> certainly false. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think God knows the, you know, our hearts desires and our hearts way better than even we do. And, um, I definitely do not think it means prosperity. I think God can give prosperity, but, um, I don't know about anybody else, but I've felt the most blessed and going through hardships just because it has increased my faith and my trust and my relationship with him, um, in ways I think money could never do. So that's my answer. Amen. Good answer. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Um, let's, ben, you always go last. Let me trick, trip you up and ask you to go next instead of last. Okay. Um, well, I'd be willing to bet. No, I'm not willing to bet. But uh, usually when I see something like this, um, a verse like that, there's probably something in the context, either in the direct context or before or after in one of the Psalms talking about God giving you a new heart. So once you have that new heart, uh, you know, th yeah, he, then he'll give you the desires of it because um, they're in, in, in harmony with his, his desires. Um, and even, even, even if that's not explicitly stated somewhere in the context, uh, I, I think that we all understand that that's the case. Um, and whether or not we have prosperity on this earth, well, Yes and no. I mean, I, uh, I you know, I, the, what we have here right now, we, we're having prosperity. This is my prosperity on this earth is the fellowship with you guys and uh, all the things I'm able to do and learn about him in this earth, uh, on this earth about, you know, I have a lot of uh, computer equipment and uh, technology to help me learn his word better. Uh, that's definitely accelerated my my learning. Um, you know, then I, you know, think about think about what it would be like in the old days we had go cross down to get a scroll and compare it and probably get, you've had a very limited time to review it. Now I could put parallel scriptures right next to each other and compare and contrast and jump around to and fro. Um, so definitely, uh, yes, uh, it, it, I think he will do that. It gives you desires of your hearts because you have a new heart um, that's desiring after what he desires. And so uh, some of that prosperity could come uh, on this earth, but it's also, it's, it's spiritual, um, it's spiritual, um, prosperity that will pay, has, you pay dividends in this life and, uh, uh, in the new birth. So 
Hmm. Yeah, amen. Very well said, brother. I, I, I don't think it's true for everybody because part of how we uh, grow and mature spiritually depends on how we respond to the spirit that wants to transform us. We can resist it. We can embrace it. Uh, but um, I, I believe in, in, in my case, from my own experience and other people I've observed, I, I don't think that uh, uh, the desires I had before I got saved if I was to think that I'll get saved and then those, all those desires will come to pass, um, that that wouldn't be good because the desires I had <laughs> before I got saved are, um, I, I know God didn't, that's not his plan, was not his plan for my life, those things. And, and uh, so over time, all my desires have been changing and changing. And now, you know, nobody would have ever believed that I have a desire to talk to people about Jesus and talk to people who love Jesus all the time on the internet. And uh, so that's an example of um, uh, 180 degrees and ch change in my mind, what, what my desires are now. Uh, but I'll give you the context, uh, Ben, um, since you said the context would probably uh, make a difference. Verse three, four, and five together reads, trust in the Lord, and do good, so shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. There it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Sister Lisa. Maybe she's not available. How about Sister Angel? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I unmuted, but I didn't realize I was muted on All the right, screen. So I had a I had a double mute going. <laughs> My bad. Okay. Um, I'm just talking. Okay. Uh, I didn't disagree with anybody. Everybody was wonderful. The answers were wonderful. Uh, I think that uh, it's it's kind of both. You know. When you when you get saved, the Lord is going to change a lot of your desires for sure. Uh, so he actually will give you new desires, the desire itself. Uh, so that that's kind of a play. That's like a double thing going there. He will give you a desire as well as fulfill it. So he bring he'll he'll give it to you and then bring it to pass. So that's right. a beautiful thing. Uh, also. Like uh, when I was a child, I used to look at the map of the United States and I would dream. I'd say, I want to see every state. You know, I just, that was my dream. And when I got older, the Lord blessed me with a job that allowed me to see, with the exception of Alaska and Hawaii, and if the Lord tarries in the world, don't go crazy. <laughs> I still intend to go. Uh, I've seen every state in the United States. So he gave me, I think, literally the desire as well as fulfilled it. So that's just a little something that was just something I wanted and the Lord blessed me with it because it wasn't look, it wasn't good or evil as far as that go. Wasn't nothing evil about it. So he blessed me with the fulfillment of that desire. And because I had uh, grew up in a small little area out here in California and I said I didn't want to be one of those people who never went more than, you know, 40 blocks from their house their whole life. I, I don't think that's necessarily a tragedy. I just didn't want to be one of those people. So um <laughs> Now he's still got to work on me on the flying thing because uh, I can't, I can't, I don't dig that. But but uh, we'll see, we'll see. Maybe he's working on me on that. But uh, he had to give me the de desire, and so far it ain't there. <laughs> so <laughs> stuff like that. And then also uh, when I got a little bit older, and I said, well, Lord, I want to be able to share, you know, share your word with people. And this was long before you know, the internet and, and, and YouTube was even a blip on radar screen. I mean, I, yeah, I literally came up when all this stuff was, I mean, y'all, we talking about Atari and, you know, the little, yes. ooh, 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 all that stuff, <laughs> you know, I mean, stuff that the children would laugh at now if they, if they went to play it, they'd be like, y'all, how did you, they wouldn't even be interested in it. They'd be like, just go away with that, you know, cause it was black and white and, or gray and, you know, the video games and stuff like that. It wasn't anything like we have now. So the whole, we had net, uh, what was it? CompuServe and 
some of the um what do they call that uh prodigy uh, well yeah you remember the internet the first parts of the internet how they had what was Both it of- aol and you had all those little things i mean Netscape, it was slow yeah and oh, you yeah. had dial up and, and you know some people don't even know they have no clue you had to wait 20 minutes to get on the internet you know turn it on and oh. get it. the computer had to warm up and all that stuff so all of this stuff that i have seen you know, has, has been interesting and been uh, a journey, but the Lord has blessed me with not only giving me certain desires, but fulfilling them after he gave them to me. So uh, it, it's more than just whatever you want. And, and, and then the other is the longer that I live, the, the less that uh, I'm concerned about riches. Riches is, you know, only the fake get a cake, the real get no deal. We're supposed to wait for the, the payoff from when we get up there. A lot of people think, you know, they said, I never forget there was a uh, gentleman that uh, stood up and mocked the living God on one of these aware, award ceremonies. And they seem, that just seems to be the anthem now to mock God. But he said, uh, I never forget it. He said, waiting for it till you get to the other side is a hustle. And I said, that's blasphemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's he's the one that said we were not to lay up for ourselves treasure on this earth. He's the one that said that. So I said, oh, that's OK. You know, y'all can take yours now. I'm going to take mine over there where I can lay it out on the line. And I ain't got to worry about nobody stealing it. I come back however many, if you, if they, whatever, because there's no time up there. We are going to be outside of space and time, however long. And it's still there. It ain't one penny, not one brown penny as far as that would go in, in whatever the wealth is missing. You know, I'll, t- I'll wait and take it up there. I ain't got to sleep with one eye open and I don't have to worry about somebody robbing me or, or slow trailing me home from the bank because they think I got money because I got a nice ride. Now, that old craziness that you have to watch out for in this demonic world. So I wait for it to like get on the other side. That's all right with me. But yeah, I think that uh, he gives you the very desires themselves. He changes your desires. Then he fulfills them because he he shows you he gives you something. He might tell you something and people think you crazy. Oh, you crazy. You ain't never going to be that ain't going to never have you tell you had to kind of you have to learn how to keep keep some things close to your vest because not everybody can get uh, on board with the vision the Lord may have given you. And then then he fulfills it. And, you know, that satisfaction to know that wasn't anybody but the Lord It's it's, it's just such a blessing. Yeah, amen. Uh, I, can I uh, get an invitation to come and visit you in your mansion sometime? <laughs> well, I tease a family member all the time. Uh, when we kind of we're, we're very close, but when we get on each other's nerves a little bit, I'm like, I'm gonna ask the Lord to make sure my mansion is not next to yours in heaven. And they're like, That's all right with me. The further away, the better. You know, we, we, we clown about these things, but at the same time, we, yes, brother, I grant you permission. I grant everybody on the panel permission. You may pop up at any time you get ready. It's all right with me. Cause I don't think we're going to have those encumbrances that we have here, <laughs> the same trappings and stuff that we have here. I'm so looking forward to the, the, the fellowship that we're going to have. We can have glorious fellowship, just little glimpses here, like tonight in, in, being a blessing to one another and uplifting and encouraging one another, even in these dark moments on this earth. How much more when we have none of that crap, none of the, I'm going to pay the light bill. I'm going to pay the gas bill. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I got to get up and go to work tomorrow. None of those encumbrances, none of that bondage and darkness and ugliness and all the trappings of this life that weigh us down. None of that up there. And and then and then to be in your perfect state, I don't know whatever age it was. Maybe maybe twenty five was when you was in your prime. You have a body like that, and, and 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 young and handsome and beautiful and virile and strong and just come all of the best of everything that you could ever imagine with no sorrow with it. I can't wait, but we're gonna have to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <I'm> excited. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let me see. Uh, Angel, what's your answer? Wow. Uh, Lisa kind of, uh, well, she kind of read my mind um, because I know exactly what she means about uh, the Lord um, giving her uh, desires that she never really had. Um, and I, I agree that God really does uh, fulfill your heart's desire. Um, but if we understand that the person before you're saved, you know, um, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 
So I don't believe that uh, it would make sense for him to give us the desires of a, of a wicked and deceitful heart that would only harm us. And uh, I, I definitely uh, believe he's speaking of the heart of flesh that he gives us upon believing, um, which it's really t- telling that so many people interpret that to mean riches, like wealth, like, you know, like the name it and claim it, whatever. I'm so unfamiliar with all that because I, I've never like, I, I've been so put off by that since even before I believed that I've never even come anywhere near it. I've never even heard a prosperity gospel sermon. So when people talk about it a lot, I, I, I mean, I, I agree it's, it's, it's terrible, but I, I don't really have any personal experience with it because I stay away from it, like that far away from it. Um, and I've never known anybody that believes that stuff. Um, but uh, thankfully, uh, but um, I, you know, uh, leading up to even getting saved, there were things that God, really put in my heart I saw that uh that I'd never cared about before like a love for you know creation a love for plants um um where I I would get giddy over you know really all I have to do to entertain myself is walk through a a patch of woods I've never been to and see what kind of (laughs) stuff is growing in there down to the moss you know and and I never paid attention to things like that and it was um you know and, and after I got saved I realized it was it was like something that he uh I believe that he, he gave to me because um, it kind of helped it helped bring me um, closer to him faster. I really I really believe that. And now it's it's funny and it sounds it sounds kind of it's pretty carnal, but I think it's just a little thing he does for me. Like there will be some <laughs> we like some plant, some house plant that you know you just can't find. You can't find it stores. It's not going to be in stores. It's like rare and you never see it in the store or whatever. And um, and I'll, I'll just pop in sometimes just to look and see what they have. And suddenly that plant, that one plant that I've been, it'll be there, you know, and, um, and, and in, in strange little ways too. Like I always feel like he is usually at a time in my life. Like one time it happened right when my, my baby and I were in the hospital for, uh, you know, that week when she got sick. And when I came out, it was like this palm tree I wanted. <laughs> and it is, it sounds dumb, but like I have this, uh, this was just like a new thing. I'd never cared about stuff like that especially growing up in the Florida Key is where it's like a, you know, I mean, it just, you name it, everything grows there. You have orchids that just grow naturally <laughs> in the trees there. And um, I never cared about anything like that until, um, you know, until right, right before I got saved, I started to be interested in nature. And then, um, but the most, in, the most incredible stuff that uh, God has done in my heart, you know, I feel like in terms of directing my heart to where I feel my desires have changed is that um, in the past I had sort of a an ill-defined, you know, misguided desire to see, you know, others happy or see good things happen to other people. But now, um, you know, upon having you know actually been born again and uh, understanding the gospel, um, there's nothing that raises my spirits and just, you know, warms my heart more than seeing people get it, seeing people from, you know, come from a place of unbelief to a place where they're at the very least, they're starting to understand that God's word is true. And that's, um, that's something that is, uh, you know, I, I, like food for my soul now. And it, in the past, I mean, I, you know, as much as I might've wanted to do good for others, or so, I didn't know what, what, what good was. What could you do good for others? God has um, reformatted um, and pri- reprioritized, all, you know, all of my most important values. And if you're saved, um, you know, what you value, that's going to, you know, you know, that, that that's, you know, really, I would think what your heart's desire is. That's going to be inspired by your knowledge of his word and um, and the truth of God. And so uh, there. So, of course. When he uh, uh, fulfills your desires, honestly, your greatest desires. I mean, I can't. I, it would be hard for me to imagine a, a believer whose whose greatest desire was to to be rich, uh, unless they were just real nihilistic and they had just decided to turn it over to God and you know, like this whole place has fallen, it's it's pointless. Um, but uh, so I'm just going to try to I don't know, live it up while I'm here or something. I mean, I could honestly see somebody that believed. The, the word and believed and believed the gospel if, if they were just really that they were in their flesh and, and really kind of that pessimistic um i just see them uh, thinking that way but most of the time these are people that they're the same people that really kind of trust in the idea that man can save the world i've noticed it's a lot of the people that Humanist. are like the in yes and the nar people you know the new apostolic reformation and the um uh 
a lot of the uh, people that are like pastors around Trump, you know, they have a, a prosperity gospel. And a lot of the people that are, they call themselves Christians, but they're enamored of Trump. And they really think that he's going to bring in some, some utopia. He's going to fix, he's, they call him the God emperor, which is scary. And they're talking about it from a, uh, from a Christian perspective. They're calling him the God emperor, that, that, you know, he was appointed by God to, to lead America into some, you know, uh, golden age. And I see that really tied in with the, this idea of the prosperity gospel. And I think that, that it's, it all comes down to the same problem, which is that you're, you're placing way too much value in, in this world and in the um, uh, material things and also like political, um, uh, you know, the, the idea that anybody's going to, you know, make this place better, somehow save this place before Jesus comes and, you know, makes it anew. So, um, but I, but I, it's, I think that, uh, Ben and Lisa put it really, really well about, uh, you know, your heart changing in there for, yes, it's true that God can fulfill your heart's desires. Mm, amen. Now you what? Turn pop in. Um, go ahead, Brother Cripps. Oh, is, uh, what I what, uh, I was just going to add, blab it and grab it. She said name it. Is that, yeah, blab it and grab it. Blab it and grab it. That's all. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, pop in, uh, obviously, uh, some people do not like when someone pops in on them. But if, if I was to pop in on someone now, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show up at your door and knock unexpectedly. But in eternity, if I pop in, I'm just going to not going to knock on the door. I'm just going to materialize myself right in your living room with you. But you won't be embarrassed. There's nothing to catch you doing that there's going to be embarrassment to you. You'll just welcome me and we'll, We'll just be, I uh, have a celebration. Oh, I forgot to add, Lisa. That's funny that you won't fly. I have flown before, but uh, I don't know if it was really since being saved or, or since becoming a mom, but I won't fly ever again. Like, I really won't fly ever again. I think I think mainly because of having children. Uh, I know that they rarely crash, man, but when they do, <laughs> they crash bad. So I, I just don't, I don't think I could. I, 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 I could be okay with putting my fate in God's hands. But I'm still not really okay with the idea of leaving my children too soon. Whether or not it was God's plans, I'm still pretty attached to the idea of not, not of not dying before I raise my children. So I'm not gonna ever get in a plane. I, I feel you, Lisa. It's very limiting. It, it kind of sucks. Uh, anybody want to add to this question? Or are we should move on. Okay, Ben. Let's go to the next one. Okay. The next question is true or false. Believe this is again, Heather's uh, true or false. Believing any kind of false doctrine means you're not saved. Hello. I think we're all thinking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm thinking about how to answer it. Yes. Uh, all right, Chris, you want to go first? Oh, sure. Uh, certainly false. Um, it didn't take me much time thinking about this one because this comes up all the time. You have uh, one camp that thinks that anyone that has any kind of thing uh, just off, even a little bit. You're, um, oh, Angel, you need to mute, darling. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Did I, I, I mute it? Oh, sorry. Man, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. Oh, where's my phone? I have my phone charging, so I don't have it up right by me. Oh, no. Sorry, guys. Um, you have one camp that thinks if anyone has anything just off or doesn't match up with they with what they think you should believe, um, then, you know, you're not saved. Um, and and that's, that's pretty widespread. Or if you don't believe what their denomination believes, then you're not saved. Um, I think that someone that has a false doctrine could be saved and they could just be, um, uh, could be confused. But again, if the, they are truly saved, then they would have the Holy Spirit to contend with on that. Cause I do not believe the Holy Spirit will allow someone, uh, to continue in a false doctrine. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm sure people would argue with that, uh, if it goes on and on and on and on, but they really believed it and they were saved, then I'm not anybody to try to decide 
what God's standards are for someone else. So, um, yeah, that's my answer. Mm-hmm. All right. How about Sister Lisa? What do you say? Ooh. See, I don't know about this because it, do me a favor. Shoot me the question one more time. Could you recite it again? Because I'm away from that screen. Sure. It is. It, the question is true or false. Believing any kind of false doctrine means you're not saved. Yeah. See, that's kind of. Uh, no, for, I would certainly say false. I mean, please, people have believed false doctrine all the time. I, I would say I would even extend that. I know the question really doesn't because I think it's 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 keeping this according to like any biblical doctrine. But there are people who've been deceived about a thousand things right here in this world that we've all been lied to and we believe them. And some of them, I'm sure we even all still hold to thinking it's real and it ain't. And as we discover stuff is just when you discover the truth, what do you do with it? You know, it says that that uh, quote I've, I've used it. Brother Luke uses it a lot, which is when an honest, honestly mistaken man discovers he's mistaken, he will either cease to be mistaken or no longer be honest. So it, it it's what do you do with the truth when you find it? Because a lot of people are in darkness and don't know they're in darkness in an area. I'm not talking about being saved. They're saved, but they don't. They they don't realize something they've swallowed hook, line, and sinker is false. That's that's the biggest thing is getting them to see that it's false. Yeah. Uh, who was it? Uh, Mark Twain that has said it's easier to fool a person than it is to convince them that they've been fooled. Yeah. This is exactly the the conundrum that uh, that that they face. Um. So yeah. I'm witnessing that right now every day. It right now in this world. Broadcast and a lion, 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 lion is not real science. It's not real. It's it's literally garbage. Yep. But people have believed it. They operate accordingly. It's just like when you train that flea, you take, you know, put that flea in the jar and you put the lid on the jar and it keeps bouncing and hitting its head until one day it says, I'm tired of hitting my head and it jumps just short of the jar. And that's when you can take the lid off the jar and they will never jump out of that jar because they they still think that that lid is on that jar. Yep. And that that's what they they are, we are witnessing in right now today, literally. So uh but am I going to say that these people aren't saved because they can't see the truth? No. Um they just I don't know why there are people who are able to have discernment and we've all been burned I have been burned. There are times in areas I have been tricked by people and I was not able to perceive that they were tricking me and got burned. Yep. I'm still a believer, but I'm like, okay, Lord, I got snookered on that one. I don't know why I couldn't hear your voice if you was warning me why I missed it, but I learned a lesson. So uh, some things are also a, a way to learn a lesson as well. Sometimes the Lord will permit you to go through things to to teach you, you know, I, uh, I once heard, I don't remember who said this exactly. It's a financial guy. I can't remember his name, but he said, he, he says you paid a stupid tax on that one, you know, when you get burned. So, but you know, it's a lesson learned. So I will chalk it up to that. So I'm going to say, was it, this was a true or false on that question. Yeah. So then false, um, no, they're not. They're not not saved. I hope I got that right because yeah, I get twisted around sometimes the way the question is phrased. Uh, just because they can't see something is not indicative that they're not saved. It just means they don't have revelation or understanding in that area. Now, something Brother Cripp said that I want to comment on where he said he doesn't believe that a person will continue in it. Uh, I, I would say I'm not so sure about that because... Uh, <laughs> People's level of understanding is contingent upon the revelation of the truth, and whether got, or not. I got to interrupt you. I got to. I didn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't say it like that. What I'm saying is, I believe that if they are saved, the Holy Spirit will continue to work in their lives. Okay. Yeah. Not. I, not I, that they. Yeah. Okay, I understand, but I also know that 
there are times that a person can't see because of their level of understanding. Now, yes. what do I mean by that? Let me see. Okay. There were certain things that I could explain to my grandmother that she would get. She was 93 years old and there were certain things she was never going to get. She would never understand because of the, the, the life that she lived and where she came from and her understanding, she was not going to be able to put those things together. Okay. I, I, and it didn't make her unintelligent, didn't make her love God any less. I'm sure. It's just her level of understanding. And because of her level of understanding, it, it, it is sad, but it becomes a form of blinders. Yet that's just where she is. It's not even an indictment. You know, I'm not saying it as a negative thing. There are some people that just cannot see what is going on right now. And it doesn't make them evil. Their level of understanding is, is in a certain place. And they're not able to have that level of discernment. I'm not saying that makes me any smarter, wiser, closer to God, any of that. A lot of that has to do with experience. So, I mean, when, you, when you've been uh, brainwashed, literally brainwashed, that doctors are like just short of God. And remember, now we've been conditioned for that our whole lives. I mean, my gr my parents and even my, my grandmother, they grew up with, with, with broadcasts like Marcus Welby, MD. I mean, he was the guy that came and, oh, he was only the kind, he was only about good. And they don't know that these doctors now they've changed the, the Hippocratic oath and they take a, a oath to Apollo, which is Satan. They don't know that. And I tell my grandmother, she couldn't process that. She'd be looking at me like I was half crazy. So, this is this is what I'm saying. So it you know I I can, it depends on what we're talking about. It depends on what's going on. I, I don't judge. I just go. You know what? That's just where this person is, and all I can do is pray for them. Because really, the only one who can open their eyes, if a person is in darkness and has believed a lie, is God. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, Sister uh, Jen? Uh, I was going to say certainly false. Um, I commented in the comments above that after I got saved and believed in the gospel, um, I was within a church that was sort of cultish, and it was very much pushed that if you weren't close to God, you needed to do more works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I really <laughs> fell into this false doctrine of believing that because I didn't have this close relationship with God that I wanted, that it seemed that other people, you know, and it was other people that had been in the faith a lot longer, had been saved a lot longer, um, that I was doing something wrong. I wasn't trying hard enough or working hard enough or doing enough works. Um, right. So that's why I'm, I'm, it's one of the re personal reasons why I'm leaning toward certainly false, because as long as you have that, the gospel correct, um, I completely agree with sister Lisa. She explained it so much more eloquently, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I certainly false for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Angel. Certainly false. And I, you know, I think we all better hope it's false because I'm sure, uh, most, if not all of us, you know, maybe there's one perfect person among us, but, uh, uh, we believe one false doctrine or another. False doctrine is just basically error and, um, uh, you know, error that we hold to. Uh, and it doesn't have to be salvific. Obviously, we, you know, something that's salvific, uh, they have to have to believe correctly before they can get saved. But beyond, you know, uh, salvific uh, doctrine, um, uh, you know, I, I, I used to, when I first got saved, <laughs> uh, I used to, I used to think like, well, how could somebody that's saved, you know, be so wrong? Because I hadn't been, I hadn't been uh, humbled enough by realizing, you know, the things that I had wrongly believed uh, right. in terms of, you know, my, my the, the doctrinal understanding, you know, because when you first get saved, you're not even sure what you believe. And then you start believing your first round of things, uh, <laughs> but, you know, beyond the, beyond the gospel <laughs> and you have to get, you have to get checked. Uh, and uh, once I had, you know, realized that, um, you know, even things that, I really felt sure that the Holy Spirit had led me to, he then led me past them also. Nice. And so I realized that, you know what I mean? And so I do like, there's certain um, things that I believed initially that I, I, I think that God, because I, I really felt him uh, teaching me things, 
but uh, but he had to he had to you know lead me to these things to lead me past them. And um, that those uh, you know I think that hopefully uh, you know for most people it's a process throughout their lives. Um, but there's a lot of people who just are not they're not very intellectually curious, and so they're not even going to necessarily know where they stand on half the doctrinal questions we know. Um, and they won't, you know, and they won't be able necessarily to defend them, you know, and it doesn't mean they're not saved. It doesn't mean they're not filled with the Holy spirit. It just means that that's, you know, they're, they're, they're not that type of person. They're, they don't, uh, you know, you, you, you God, God's not going to force you to suddenly become, you know, this extremely uh, curious investigative type person who, you know, sits there and ponders things and expounds upon things and starts a YouTube channel talking about, you know, doctrinal issues. That doesn't happen to everybody. And uh, I think that uh, when we're like that, you know, the kind of people that we are, we're, we're really passionate about those things. It's really important not to um, look upon people that believe the simple gospel and, and don't uh, don't have that enthusiasm or curiosity about understanding all of all, you know, all these different doctrinal, doctrinal ins and outs. Um, because I don't, you know, God didn't make everybody the same way. And, um, uh, you know, all they really need to know is, uh, is the, you know, the basics, is the, you know, they understand the gospel and they believe it. You know, I've mentioned my father a couple of times now, but he's a very good example of, of somebody that, um, you know, uh, has always believed, you know, wholeheartedly, no question, believe that, believe the true gospel, but, you know, I, he wouldn't even have an opinion on half of the doctrinal things that we discuss. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't even uh, know where he stood to, to begin with. Um, and then if, uh, you know, uh, I guess if there, if there was something that he had a belief he had held for a long time, you know, uh, you know, some of those things that are non-salvific, he, you know, he's, he's not going to let go of now because <laughs> he's old and these things are like, you know, central to some part of his identity. And so he's not going to let go of them. Um, and he doesn't even really like to question them. And, uh, but that doesn't make him any less safe because, you know, there was never any way to make my dad budge on the gospel or, or Jesus, no matter how many times I, uh, you know, I, I insulted him and it was just horribly disrespectful and arguing with him and trying to make him answer questions I thought were so clever, like, you know, as an atheist, think, oh, gotcha, gotcha. It didn't matter how many times I got him to where he couldn't explain something. It never changed how much he believed it. You know what I mean? So, um, but you know, yeah, absolutely. It's false because uh, you can either, you can either have, you know, the, I'm sure I will go to my grave uh, believing at least one false doctrine. I'm certain of it. I mean, you know, maybe not, but I don't know if anybody ever has, <laughs> you know, I wonder if anybody's ever gone to the grave uh, knowing, you know, being correct with every doctrinal position. No. Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, sister, uh, sister, did you see me uh, applauding your answer? Me? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. My yeah, phone's I, I charging. Was a, I was a, well, if you watch it back, you'll see what I was applauding you. I thought, thought your answer <laughs> was so good. Thank you. Uh, it is a point that uh, we, we better all be humble enough to admit this and that uh, – I don't know a person. I never have known a person. I doubt there has ever been a person that got every single thing in the Bible 100% correct. Uh, it, right. it, I've said this before that does does anybody understand every verse in the Bible perfectly? Uh, I doubt it. Now, it, can you? Maybe, but uh, I doubt it. But uh, should we strive for that? Yeah, that's what I'm striving for. But uh, thankfully, as you said, sister, Thankfully, we don't have to because if we had to, none of us would be saved. Yeah. That that would become what was called. I'm just coined the term because this the subject we're talking about. I would call it theological legalism. It is, it's uh, uh, that you got to get all your your theology just right and just right according to who <laughs> you know because every theological position there's always a you know a, a, at least two or more sides yeah and so uh now i know that i made a video a few years ago i titled i think um eight times i changed my mind so there's at least eight times that i can recall that i did change my doctrinal position on something so um i was wrong and now i, I think i got it right but maybe i'm wrong now and if i was wrong then and admit it that 
it certainly must make me think it's possible I could be still wrong on some other things. So thank you, Lord, that I don't have to get it all right. I think we got to get two things right, and that is, uh, who is Jesus and how do I get saved? And it, it boils down to uh, uh, faith in the person and finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. When we say this term, uh, it's a clever way of expressing it. I think it's a valid, true, uh, fundamental. Uh, the gospel is the cross plus nothing. If we add anything to that, then uh, it, it's, it has no value. You've ruined it. Anything in terms of where we're requiring certain religious works in a person's life or whether we're imposing some kind of theological um, uh, checklist where they have to have all their the theology just right, according to you. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, if a person ha understands, uh, has faith in the person and finished work of Christ, then they could be wrong about everything else in the Bible. 99% of stuff in the Bible, you could be wrong about it. And you probably are wrong about much of it. No matter how much you seriously you do take upon your studies, you're gonna you're still wrong about quite a bit. I, I'm certain of that. So I, I hope we can refrain from imposing. Uh, you know, sometimes there's things that even if we figure out some uh, subtle point that uh, maybe we think that that point's a very important uh a distinction that needs to be clear uh, and, and maybe we're even right about it well to expect that everybody has to come to that conclusion and or else they're not saved uh, you're adding to the to the cross it's no longer cross plus nothing all right Excellent. Um, all right Ben what about you okay um well, I think, uh, you know, we, we've heard that there are some who say, uh, well, a believer can fall into error, um, but there's a certain kind of error that, that that a guy will never allow him to fall into. Like, uh, so, for example, um, you know, you could you could fall into error, but as long as it's not the same kind of error that would keep an unbeliever condemned, that error, that kind of error, uh, a damnable heresy, as they'll sometimes say, uh, that kind of thing, um, God will never let happen. But, I mean, if you just read scripture, uh, you have to ignore a lot of scripture to come to that conclusion because uh, the Bible is replete with examples of believers falling away, not only from sound doctrine, but from the faith altogether. Um, and I personally believe it's, again, it's a very self-centered, self-important view because it basically says that, you know, oh, well, God will let you fall into certain areas, specifically those that won't, he won't let you fall into certain areas, specifically those that pertain to personal salvation, but he will allow you to fall all into all sorts of errors about him. I mean, if you think about it, what do you think God would be more grieved about? A, a, an unsaved Lord shipper who preaches perfectly on, God, on the doctrine of God's righteousness, supremacy, uh, glory, or a saved believer who believes in the in the you know person and finished work of the cross, but also believes and teaches others that God no longer cares about sin and wants us to enjoy enjoy ourselves and just let it rip? Uh, what do you think was more important to God, your reputation or His reputation? Uh, What's more important to God, your witness that you're saved to others or you misrepresenting his character? I mean, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and, they, you know, they also kind of say things like, oh, well, uh, well, if you're saved, well, then these verses, uh, you these certain verses, you might not understand all verses, but these certain verses of their own selection, you will believe uh, and you will get right. Um and you'll properly understand. If you don't properly understand it my way, then you can't possibly be saved because that it, it really they're basically saying yes to the question. Believing uh, false doctrine means you're not saved. That's what they're basically saying to this question. Is they're answering certainly true. Um, yet again, I think we all agree that we I, I'm, I'm I could fall to false doctrine any time. Uh, I'm very careful about that, um, and I think we always need to be on guard about it. And I'm sure there's things I, I am uh, minor doctrines I am. Uh, still uh, deceived or incorrect about um and again i, I just uh you know it's a very self-centered view of, of scripture in that the oh you you may understand other you might misunderstand other verses but these verses that pertain especially to personal salvation and faith oh well you'll never fall into, into uh or misunderstand those verses yet you ask them about another verse uh and they'll have no understanding of it at all or they'll have they'll have a totally wrong interpretation a provably wrong interpretation 
Um, so again, again, I think it's just a very self-centered view of of the of uh, of themselves essentially, and they think that their salvation, that the Bible is all about personal salvation. The Bible is about God and what He did. In fact, the only reason you're saved is so that He could show the exceeding riches of His grace in the ages to come, and so that He could, you know, disarm the principalities' powers and make a spectacle of them. Um, it's not about, I mean, yes, God loves you. Not, I'm not saying that at all, but it's ultimately about his glory. Saving you is about his glory, not you uh, uh, being perfect in your doctrine. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll add a point. Thank you, brother. That was very good. I, I, we've all heard of a, a, a group of uh, people called Gnostics. And that's an ancient word, but uh, the word we hear more often today is agnostic. And so what is an agnostic? Uh, the word gnostic or gnosis means knowledge. Agnostic is without knowledge. So if a person is an agnostic, they would say, I don't have enough knowledge to say there's God or not. I'm undecided. I'm agnostic. I, I don't know. Uh, so what is Gnostic? It's a person that believes that they know things. And uh, uh, the Gnostics that we, uh, we study about through church history, uh, that uh, they believe that uh, you're saved by knowledge, by acquiring knowledge, particularly what they refer to as secret knowledge. So uh, I think that it, there are people who are uh, uh, almost worshiping this knowledge and uh, in addition to the simple gospel, and uh, this, as I said, faith in the person and finished work of the cross, and, it, and all the other things that are much of it, maybe you get it right. Um, but whether you're right or wrong, to have the, the conclusion that the knowledge you've acquired on this point, which I would call a fine point, a, a deeper understanding maybe, and, and whether it's a valid point or a false, the wrong conclusion, to, to believe that if other people can't see it or if they come to a different conclusion, that that somehow proves that they don't have the Holy Spirit. If they had the Holy Spirit, obviously they would be able to see what you see and come to the same conclusion. So uh, if that's what's happening, then we're and we're adding we, we become a, a, a gnostic in, in a way believing that this special knowledge is uh is the key to salvation awesome. all right any more from anyone on that question well i just love what you said luke that's exactly it that's what it ends up coming manifesting itself they say i'm sorry you don't have what i have you don't know that you don't have what i have but i can tell you that you don't have what i have um and you're a false convert and you don't realize it. And, but I, and I can't tell you exactly what you don't have, but you don't have what I have, but you don't have it. <laughs> uh, ready for the next question? Yeah. Let's go to okay. the next one. Okay. True or false? This is your question, Luke. True or false? Calvinism is entirely based on luck. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's my question. So I'll go last on this one. Uh, how about Brother Cripps? Why don't you go first? Yeah, I'd be, be glad to. Um, gosh, uh, I believe I'm going to just read it and make sure oh, it's not up yet. Um, could you read the phrasing of the question again for me, Ben? Yeah, I just sure. put it in chat again. I, I put it in chat. You see it? Yeah, I do. Sorry, my fault. No problem. Calvinism is entirely based on luck. Yes, ultimately. Now, I'm actually kind of impressed with this question because it, it is distilled from the top with all the different things they believe and all the intricacies. And um, honestly, Calvinism is pretty deep, in my opinion. Uh, and I think that people that actually believe it consider themselves pretty intelligent and with it uh, based on the complexity of all the different stuff that they believe. So this is distilled down, according to them. I'm not saying it's true. It's distilled down for them to, to this point, but they refuse to admit it. If all their things are true, it's based on luck for the person, because what it means is that God decided who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. Uh, so I, I think it's a great question. So I would say 
uh, because it says entirely, um, I can't say uh, certainly true. So I'll, I'll say leaning true. Okay. All right. Uh, how about Brother Ben? What do you say? Well, I think we all agree that uh, there is no such thing as luck. But yes, ultimately, it is the uh, God's, uh, you know, you're, you're lucky in the sense that, yeah, God, God chose you and, and uh, from, from the beginning and, and uh, you weren't uh, among the unchosen. So, right. yes, it, it is entirely based on luck. And you're right, Crips, it, it is ultimately what it boils down to. And the reason Cal I believe Calvinism is, 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 is complex. Well, the truth we know, the gospel is simple. The, the wisdom of the world, uh, you know, couldn't wouldn't ha have ever arrived at the gospel. But you know, God again changed the changed the wise. Um, and I believe the reason Calvin's complex is they don't, they don't really understand what they're saying. They have to use all kinds of sophistry to explain this and to plug this hole and uh, you know all that kind of stuff. And so uh, the truth is simple. And they the reason they they make it muddy and complex and difficult to understand um, because it's false. Hmm. Falsity, false, false, as Crips would say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you get brownie points. Uh, all right, uh, how about uh, Sister Jen? <laughs> um, hold on, I'm scrolling back up. Calvin isn't entirely based on luck. I'd say definitely true. I don't know a whole lot about Cal. I haven't dove in, you know, to check out all, but I know enough to know that they, you know, with the whole predestination and some of the other tenants of the tulip. Yeah, I think it's based on, on luck. And I, I'll second Ben. I don't really believe in luck. I'd probably maybe say like fate. But, uh, but yeah, I'd say true. Certainly true. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sister Lisa? Um, I, I think I would say false, but with a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I would be like Calvinism is based on lies so I'm not going to be nice about it I told you anytime there's isms when you see ism I, I, I'm ready to already run I already got my bags packed to head for the door <laughs> so you know I haven't seen anything other than the true isms that are found in scripture Though that's the only one I'll accept but you know <sighs> I don't know what ma gave man the idea that he was supposed to just, I mean, even the audacity, and, and I, I don't think it was necessarily, I don't even know. I might mean, have to go back and look. Did they coin this themselves? I mean, did John Calvin call it Calvinism while he was walking around? That this these are my doctrines? Or did somebody name it after he, uh, you know, left the earth that this is what we believe, and it's it's after his beliefs? Because I've always thought it's so presumptuous that people broke off into these doctrines and called them this is the 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 brand of faith i've just always trembled at that because we're supposed to believe the bible period i'm you a know? paul i'm a cephas it's like the same right you know and then the bible expressly teaches against that so i mean we're supposed to be believers not factions of believers and set and different sects uh yeah. but you know here we are this, you know, it's, uh, as Paul said, he said they went out because they were not of us. So I've noticed that there's a theme for people who are non-denominational. They just say, look, we believe the faith. We're not getting into all that other stuff. And, 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 and we ourselves have separated from that, you know, those encumbrances of men, the doctrines of men that always seem to lead in some form, one way or another, at mm -hmm. various degrees of extremes, but in one way or another, error. And yeah. uh, the first slice of error, I think, is is the the them thinking they even have the right to appropriate um, the these titles that I don't know. It's it, to me, it's a form of pride uh, to do that because well, we're supposed to believe the the whole Bible. And, uh, and 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 rightly divide the word of truth to uh, come up with who is the Lord speaking to? What is he saying when he's speaking to them? Is he even talking to us? There's a lot of error because they appropriate things the Lord ain't even talking. 
you know, to to us. You know, he was talking to a specific people at a specific time in a specific place. And it wasn't at that point, even from that, go ye and do likewise. You know, and then and they don't extrapolate those things. And then we end up in all this demonic, really, error. And and the evidence is the fruit of it. It kills lies, it destroys lies, it puts men in bondage. And we see what the fruit of the spirit is. We see what should be the fruits from the true gospel. Life, peace, health, prosperity. If you don't see that stuff and you see people burned out and worn out and discouraged and hurt and harmed and lives destroyed and all manner of wickedness going on in the church, there's the fruit. <laughs> that's the fruit they're bearing unless you know that the doctrine ain't right and they ain't right. And that's why we're supposed to come out from among them and be separate and separate ourselves when we see these kind of things. Now we do have to be careful that we don't get offended at every little thing and run away. But when we look in the scripture and see that these things are clearly not the fruit of the spirit, these things are not of the Lord. We just, you, you don't have to, really, I crack up, you don't even really have to make an announcement. The Bible just says, note and avoid. <laughs> so just pull away. And, uh, I, you know, I am discouraged. I'm discouraged when I see that. I'm saddened when I see that has been tradition for many centuries now. But I believe it is grave error because it's caused people to be fragmented that are actually in the body of Christ that are in the faith. But they won't go anywhere but a Lutheran church or they won't go anywhere but a Methodist church or they won't go anywhere but a Baptist church. Yeah. And so their their lives are hindered and stifled because of it. Because as Sister Angel just said a few minutes ago, the, the Lord will lead you to something. And then when it's time to go, you go past it. Because uh, just because you grow to a point doesn't mean that's where you're supposed to stop. That's not where you're supposed to stay. You know, we're supposed to press on to the mark of the high calling of Christ. And I don't believe that his calling is limited to the title on the denomination. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, Sister Angel. So I'm going to say false uh, uh, because I, I believe I believe it's only luck and pretense, but I think at the root of it is actually pride. They might say, "Oh, it's just luck," you know, the luck of the draw. Whether they might not call it luck, or you know, God's blessing, his his predestination, but it's pride. It's pride because no matter what they say, if they believe that they are one of the elect, so one of the one of the chosen few who even can be saved. They, they could say however, whatever they want, but the truth is, they think there's something special about them. And um, and to me, you know, luck would almost be humbling because that's more like, um, oh well, you know, you just it, you know, it really, really just sort of a, a lottery, you know, uh, you know, it had nothing to do with me. It just I just so happened to be, you know, uh, uh, one of the elect. But no, it's not that. They always think it's something to do with them. They always think it's their pride. Either they're, you know, they they take the pride in their uh, what they consider to be their good works. Um, and probably for a lot of Calvinists, it's more that they have this pride in their their intellectualism because they can't imagine that. Um, People that don't share their opinion or, or that don't study as deeply as they consider themselves to study or whatever, that they could actually be saved. And, um, you know, uh, that's the opposite of what God showed me upon getting saved. I mean, it was, it was very humbling to come from this place of, base, you know, being an atheist most of my life and see, being very prideful in my intellect. And, uh, uh, and really one of the biggest problems I had is the idea that, like, Christians who I – you know, because my family, for instance, they, like I, I had said with my dad, that they, they, they couldn't really explain everything in the Bible. They weren't like super big intellectuals to where they could uh, slice and dice me in a debate. And I couldn't imagine that, uh, you know, that they would have the ultimate answer to everything. And it would be so simple when they weren't even, you know, uh, super curious about things or they, they didn't uh, overanalyze everything like I did. And, um, and so, you know, it was my pride and that would have been, I would never have fallen for a workspace doctrine, but uh, I could have very easily fallen for some sort of doctrine where it was something special about me and the fact that I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm such a deep thinker. But that's why that's why I really understood what I needed to understand to be saved. And um, uh, then when we add different doctrines to, like, on top of the gospel, it's usually, I believe, it's, it comes from that 
you know, that place of pride and wanting to separate ourselves from the masses. But, but the fact is that the gospel, you know, God's on our, on our rescue mission. And I say, it's kind of like a catch and release type thing because, um, uh, you know, he's just, he's really just trying to set the bar so low that we can't screw it up. And uh, I, I think I compared it last week to, to a, a teacher in a really bad school, just saying, you know, <laughs> basically telling the whole class, all right, if you write your name on this paper, you pass your final exam. And even most of them won't, st- they still won't do it, you know, but uh, just trying to pass a few. And I think that that's, you know, a very humbling realization to, to realize that salvation itself, you know, it's not a gold star. It's just, a, a, you know, it's like the bare minimum passing grade and everything else, you know, that's the extra credit. That's what sets you apart as a disciple or, you know, a good student, so to speak. And when, with Calvinism, um, it's just such a, it's a strange like rope-a-dope because they're trying to, you know, they, they understand enough to, to know that the, the Bible is very clear that it's not a, that your works don't save you, but, um, and that it's just about believing the gospel, but they're trying to find some way like they're trying to find some way to, uh, to to set themselves apart from either the the wretched people, like you know, let's just say like the prostitutes and drunkards that would litter the streets, you know, uh, in any you know European city, um, and that you know, but they believe that Christ died for their sins. Well, you know, prideful people that won't do. They can't be just as saved as those people. But um, but if you know that works really are forbidden in terms of you know. Uh, grounds for your salvation you've got to figure out a different way and one of those ways is to take pride in in the idea that uh that you're elect and that you're special um um and that christ only died for certain people uh and, and also you know i i see sort of this the same thing with the people a lot of people are now saying you know uh the, the wheat and the tares that a lot of people on the earth are maybe like not even like us they're not even people like they had their people call them like uh what are they called uh, uh, organic portals. There's all this craziness that tries to set, uh, you know, draw some dividing line between between people who, um, you know, they would call the sheep and the goats. Um, uh, and I and I, I just see that same spirit of pride in Calvinism. And uh, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, at least a lot of Calvinists don't they believe that if you're not a Calvinist, like if you don't actually agree about about the, the you know limited atonement and you know all the five points or or some you know uh, you know, some amount of them that you're not saved, you know, like, like, like it, I, I'm not sure about that. Cause I haven't, uh, dealt with too many Calvinists, but I, I thought that that, like, they, they kind of considered that to be, um, like, if you didn't believe the proper doctrine, you know, of Calvinism, that, that, uh, even if you believe the gospel and even if you, whatever they put persevered, uh, that, uh, that you weren't even saved, you weren't elect or you would understand. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, but I, I say false just because I, I think that, that, uh, you're being too kind by saying it's luck because it's definitely not something as random as luck in the hearts of most people that leave Calvinism. It's, it's pride. That's a great answer. Uh, can I make a quick comment? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, based on what Angel said uh, about Calvinists, whether they believe that if, if you're not a Calvinist or you don't believe their doctrine, uh, you're not saved. Uh, I think the answer to that is there are many that do. Um, okay. There, there are some that don't make it a public thing, but I've only found one that never says it. One, I, one Calvinist that I can tolerate, and I, I listened to his uh, YouTube broadcast because I, I, I started listening to it because I was like, okay, there. He seems like a really great guy, and this is true about any denomination. There can be someone that seems like a really great guy. Um, but I really listened to a lot of his broadcast because uh, I, I think essentially I was trying to find uh, where he, w- what he's saying doesn't line up with scripture. And it, I, I have found it very difficult to see that. And then I, then I started to, to like the guy and I, I'm sure I get a lot of criticism for listening to anyone that considers themselves a Calvinist, but he's just very different. And I think that could be true about any denomination. There could be someone within the denomination uh, that's, that still sees things clearly and uh, still could be saved, but they're in uh, a despicable denomination. I think that's possible. That's a great question and a great comment, Angel. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I wrote the question, so thank you for saying it was great. And Did you say who that YouTuber was? Sorry, I just wanted to, I didn't know if I missed that. Real quick. Uh, Bezel T3, Bezel T3. Okay. okay, yeah, I hadn't heard of him. Yeah, I can send you some links if you want to. Okay, yeah, that'd be cool. Sure. 
Sorry, Luke. I didn't. If you uh, know, I was struggling to unmute. <laughs> if you want to know the name of the person I believe is the very best at refuting Calvinism, I would refer you to Leighton Flowers. Oh, he's, oh I have not heard of that. He, he's a former Calvinist. And he's the most uh, articulate at, at exposing the, it, its errors. Awesome. Uh, but uh, to it's me, so frustrating. So many people that watch my videos, they think I'm a Calvinist. I'll get Calvinists coming to my channel, and they'll be like commending whatever I said, and then I'll I'll go and I'll you know look at their channel, I'll realize that they're Calvinists mm -hmm. um, because it's like half the time the only people that actually will uh, support your faith alone, you know, and no loss of salvation are, is a Calvinist. It's really, and I get accused of being a Calvinist by people when I defend eternal security. It's very frustrating. Well, the, the, the Calvinist and also the Arminian, uh, generally they both make the same mistake of, 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 a, of believing that you are, have to either be one or the other. Uh, they don't realize that there is a, a different position that is actually the real Correct position, Leighton Flowers calls it the traditionalist or the or the provisionist uh, uh, position. In other words, that God is providing salvation for everybody. Uh, it's it, every it's available to everybody. God's providing it, and uh, uh, that's the right position. But um, the reason I wrote the question the way I did and posed it, um, and the answer is uh, uh, certainly true. Uh, Calvinism is entirely. Uh, based on luck, because um, certain certain of the fundamentals of Calvinism. Uh, it, it, well, actually, let me look at the the chat room. Someone gave me a definition of luck here. I I looked. I, I thought it was very good. So let me. Third King Nine wrote, "Luck equals any circumstances or situations over which you have no control or influence." Uh, that's, I guess, a definition, dictionary definition of what luck is, something that you have no control over. You're lucky or unlucky, I guess. But uh, I think it is um, based on luck, based on this. Um, there, one of their tenets, it's not part of TULIP, but I believe it is everything else uh, rests on this one idea, and that is that man does not have free will, that God is sovereign to the extent that I call it hyper-sovereignty. They believe that God controls everything, even from every movement of every molecule, every thought I have, every word I speak, every motion. So in other words, we, we are completely controlled by God. We're only like mindless puppets. Um, and so that means that man really is, is innocent. We are not doing anything wrong. God's making us do it. So God is the guilty party. All sin is really committed by God. Yep. That's the only conclusion you can come to then. Yep. Um, but, but so that's one is that since we, we have nothing to do because we have no free will, that means if God decides to save us, then it's entirely luck. On our part, we happen to be one of the lucky ones. The other thing is um, the, the total um, inability, uh, since the, the tea and tulip is... Man has no ability to uh, believe or even uh, seek. Uh, they're basically, they say you're you're dead. A dead man can do nothing. They say, uh, but uh, obviously, even though we are spiritually dead, that is true. Yeah, uh, our souls and, and our mind and our bodies are functioning fine. We can we can do. We can think. We can reason. We can decide things. Uh, so uh, we we are we do have the ability to to seek and learn and and believe the gospel, um, but uh, the other position they hold is is unconditional election. That means there is no condition. That that means that the per people who did who do get saved, God is is selecting them based upon no factor. There is no factor that decide God is using to choose one over another. In other words, it's no more, let, let's say that you were, we're all in, in a pond uh, getting ready to drown and God knows everybody's going to drown and I'm going to pick out this one and this one and this one randomly. There, it's not based upon any personal merit. It's certainly not based on our faith because we're not able to believe according to them unless God saves us first brings our spirit to life and then we can, then we will believe 
So if that's the case, then that means that uh, you just have to be one of the lucky ones that God randomly pulls out to, to save. So uh, that's why it's a system entirely based on luck. You just have to hope that you're one of the lucky ones that God randomly selected. Let it be said for the record that uh, that I nailed your uh, your uh, question and explained what your answer would be. Okay, we'll put that in the record for the put in the record. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what, brother Luke? As you explain that, that you know what that sounds more to me like as you extrapolated their beliefs. That sounds like a carnal man trying to understand the gospel with his carnal mind without any spiritual understanding whatsoever. <laughs> now, that's what it sounds like to me on his face. It sounds like an unregenerated man trying to explain the gospel mm -hmm. and the election yeah. of God. Agreed. Well, it is It is really not uh, biblical faith at all, and it, and it can't be supported by the Bible. It's really just an evil philosophy, um, the most evil philosophy I've ever encountered. Uh, all right. Uh, any more on that before we give our, our closing remarks here? I well, think uh, I was thinking. Oh, sorry. Go on, Ben. You go first. No, no go ahead. Well, I, I just I, I see why you're saying it's 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 luck. I, doctrinally, it, it essentially boils down to luck. I guess I was thinking more of the the, the appeal, like what what causes somebody to believe it, um, which is what I was thinking of when it was based on. I was thinking of like what you know what uh, impulse uh you know causes people to want to believe such a thing especially the idea that there's people that can't be saved i mean that seems like an ugly ugly thing that uh i, I would assume it would have to have there would have to be something in it for their ego for them to even be attracted to such a such a false doctrine but yeah, now yeah. go on then <laughs> i was just gonna make a simple statement that there's a lot of the tenets of calvinism particularly around uh gift faith and perseverance uh and a few others are in common with Islam. Yeah. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah. Islam, Islam believes in determinism, as in the determinism that you find in Calvinism. That's crazy because I, I've mentioned my ex on here a few times. My, my he's from Somalia, and he was raised Muslim. And he's a he's you know pretty much a genius. He's a, I mean, he's, got a, he's like a history scholar, and he knows all about religion. And when I asked him once he returned to Islam. I asked him uh, not too long ago what the term, like what how, like what saves you what the, what basically the gospel is in Islam like how, how how does one get saved and he didn't have that answer he uh, he he basically said that uh, you basically just have to try your best and it doesn't act, you know even if you don't believe in um, Islam uh, you know that uh, that Allah will you know have mercy on you if you were a good enough person but he really didn't have a, a good answer for what it was exactly so I don't know if you know, maybe that's a sect of, of Islam he came from, but I didn't know there was any pre -eter He didn't mention that. I mean, he know he can recite every verse in the Quran pretty much, like in song form. So uh, that's surprising. But there's no doctrinal consistency with Islam either. They even have a doctrine that says there doesn't have to be any consistency. So, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, if we're finished with the questions, let's take some time now to uh, can make our closing remarks here. Uh, Sister Lisa, let's start with you and also tell us what your plan is for tomorrow. Well, right now, my plan for tomorrow is to show up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, seeking the Lord all week about which direction to go with uh, a topic, and I still have not decided as yet. I have a couple of things I'm on the fence about, but uh, it's just going to be a to be announced. So if you want to know what it's about, you got to show up tomorrow. Uh, but uh, definitely, Sister Angel and uh, Brother Ben. And uh, Brother Cripps will be there tomorrow. So we look forward to their participation. That's on my channel for the Most High Jesus, the number four, the Most High Jesus. Uh, and it's called Late Night with Lisa Friends. It starts at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. And uh, also, I wanted to uh, say one other thing uh, related to what you were just discussing, which was um, uh, the whole concept about like uh, Islam and and um, what did what did you call it, uh, Brother Luke? What was the phrase you used? Determinism. Determinism. Thank you very much. Uh, I had just posted in my community section uh, a day or two ago um, a gentleman who was a Hindu guru, 
20 years. Um, his name is Rahil Patel. He's a former Hindu priest, and he gives a testimony. It's about 30 minutes long. It's worth every minute. You should go hear it. This man, the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke to him literally to his spirit to reveal himself to him because he was steeped in all of this knowledge because he was talking about all the different books that he studied and how he, you know, he was seeking. Remember I told you that it was my personal belief that no one who is truly seeking the Lord will ever leave this earth without finding him. This man really wanted to know the true God and he found him. And it's a wonderful channel. You guys should check it out. It's called The Witness. And they have all these different people from all these different walks of life that come on there and talk about how they came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and and it, there's been I've heard uh, two testimonies so far that have been absolutely mind blowing because these people were at one was in Hinduism. I think the other one was in another form of one of the religions over there in, in the East. Uh, I don't recall the exact religion right now, but uh, he came out of that false doctrine, too, and became and became a believer. So uh, it, it's called uh, What a Glorious Testimony of the Living Risen Christ uh, 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 with um, uh, the witness in 2018, a former Hindu priest. You guys should check it out. It's in my community section on my channel. Uh, also, go check out that channel, The Witness, because they have some beautiful testimonies over there about people who came from different walks of, of life and different faiths and how they discovered the, the true Christ. And one of the points that he makes in the video, and I won't spoil it for you, but one of the points he makes is the difference between religion and a relationship with the one true and most high God. And I thank all of you. It's been a blessing. Enjoy the chat tonight uh, and everybody on the panel. Your comments were awesome. I learned so much uh, just coming and being a participant in this as we look at the word of God and uh, show what we think we see and share with one another. It gives me, you know, a different set of eyes to look at things and to get a different perspective. And just like the scripture says, iron sharpens iron. And I'm always blessed by it. And I thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Well, you too, Lisa. Amen. Thank you. All right, Sister Angel, give us your uh, summary and closing remarks. Oh, well, yes, uh, I'm glad Lisa, Lisa had the same problem I have. I thought it's been pretty stressed about what to talk about uh, this weekend also. But uh, I hope people uh, people heard our, our show last week, uh, having a, a D. Doss on. It was a real blessing. And um, he's just, uh, a, a, just a, what a nice guy, such a great guy. And uh, hopefully he'll be uh, watching some of uh, our, our Friday fellowships here soon. I'm not sure if I recommended that to him or not, but uh, but I think he needs a good, uh, a good online, a good YouTube uh, uh, fellowship. Uh, because he 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 believes and contends for the true gospel, which is just always such a miracle to me when I find somebody that's you know on some far flung you know different uh, YouTube community you know he's like into Bigfoot and they're actually contending powerfully for the true gospel. It's just a it's a wonderful thing. But um, uh, I just uh, it's it's been great to to join you guys again tonight, and I, I hope uh, I hope we all just you know really appreciate what we have here because. Um, you know, when I go out into the world, it's it's just getting crazy out there. Um, I, you know, I I was shocked even to pull up. Uh, you know, I was shop birthday shopping tonight. I, I pulled up, you know, the park next to a car, and this car was covered in all of this Antifa madness and all this this crazy and this stuff. You know, they they were just the it was insane. And I realized, oh no, it's even it's it's reached here. You know, we have a case of it here. <laughs> I thought we were safe. And, um, uh, you know, and I, I just immediately just wanted to run to you guys and, and, and just kind of uh, reorient myself because it really is, it, it's like my center. It, it really uh, helps uh, to ground me. Um, and I'm not sure, it seems like it'd be really easy to get caught up in a lot of nonsense. Um, if, uh, if I didn't have this fellowship, um, I'm not even sure, I guess churches are probably open around here. I'm not positive, but um, I know a lot of places that, that they're not opening. So um, uh, maybe maybe we started a trend that a lot of people are going to have to come to rely on now, depending where they live. But it's just been a blessing, guys. And um, and I love you all. And I think it's wonderful that we can come together and, you know, like, like our creed says, just unite around the essentials and give grace and charity on non-essentials. 
Um, and although I, I do think you'll notice a trend that seems like the Holy Spirit tends to lead us to uh, uh, kind of come into more and more agreement with one another about at least, you know, at least a whole, a whole lot of things. And um, I think that's, that's beautiful as well. But um, uh, I love you guys. And yes, I will, uh, I'll be on with Lisa tomorrow night. Awesome. Thank you, sister. So uh, I'm often very impressed with your comments. And tonight I had to applaud at one point. So yeah, great, great job, sister. And uh, <laughs> let's have brother Ben go next. Brother Ben, uh, are you a, uh, Thankful as as uh, Sister Angel asked, uh, she says she hopes we're all thankful for this fellowship. Absolutely, I am. I you know <laughs> the more I think about it, um, I think about it a lot when I'm going behind taking my dog for a walk, um, and because it, uh, I, to my mind, just kind of I'm able to reflect and get perspective. And yes, absolutely, I, I agree. This is a, a very sacred thing we have here, and it was great to have Jen with us. I hope that you enjoyed yourself. I loved your input. And um, would like to see you come back as you know, come back as a regular participant. So, uh, but other than that, I had a great time, and I uh, have some ideas, Lisa, for next tomorrow. But I'll I'll run them by you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. All right, brother, brother Cripps. Yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll start at the end of Ben's uh, uh, comment first and, and say that it was a delight for me personally. I know I'm biased, but to have uh, Jen here was uh, thrilling to me. And uh, we actually haven't done a broadcast since last October uh, of last year uh, together. So I missed it. And um, uh, I think she's going to do great. And uh, okay. Oh, I so wanted to add that too. Yes, Jen, it's a wonderful addition <laughs> to the that. panel. It's been a long time uh, since uh, since we got to hear from you, and uh, I, I was I wasn't sure if you had had said you know said goodbye to to being on the interwebs you know like that or not. But I'm really <laughs> glad you haven't. So it's good. Yeah, and there are, she doesn't she doesn't know this, uh, but there are people out there that ask about her all the time. Well, she knows something. Mm -hmm. There are people that ask about her and miss her. She's just such a uh, lovely, vivacious personality. Again, biased, uh, but I think people could see that on their own without my comments. Um, Very pretty voice, too. Very pretty voice, yes. like a bell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as the broadcast, I uh, again, I enjoy it. I always enjoy it. Um, uh, I love the questions uh, from Heather. They're, they were great. I loved everyone's answers. Uh, I'm glad everyone was ever able to be here tonight. And I look forward to next week. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Awesome. Thank you, brother. And uh, Sister Jen, I purposely saved you for last to give you the, the last word. Uh, <laughs> what was your first experience here on this panel? Uh, what did, did you like it? Was it fun? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I loved it. I loved it. And I've, I've so enjoyed listening to the, the Friday Fellowship. And it's just been such a pleasure and a delight to hang out with you guys. And, you know, um, I feel like everybody on the panel here and people in the chat probably feel the same way as I do. I've always had questions and I've always loved discussing things. And I think we learn a lot from each other. I think we can learn a lot from each other and do. And um, growing up in church, I never really found people that liked to ask all these questions. <laughs> so they all be bopped around my head throughout life. So meeting a group of people, um, fellow believers, to sit and discuss all these things and ask questions and to have our minds stretched and to go to the Word of God is a huge blessing, huge blessing. And I very much enjoyed it tonight, and I hope you guys will have me on again and I'm looking forward to Lisa's show. Usually I'm not as of a late night person as you guys. So I usually end up listening to the playback the next morning, but I've always enjoyed it. And I did very much enjoy uh, DDoS last, last week, Angel. So thank you for having me on. Awesome. That was lovely. He's and sweet. Oh, oh and I want to say again. Jen too. I know what you mean about the nobody asking questions that drives a lot of people away at, from yeah. church or even faith. Yeah, the responses I would get it was like people looked at me like I had two heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, it's it's fun and it's you know learning and getting to know each other better and getting to know God better and the Word better and I mean, how can that be bad? It's Amen. Awesome. It makes people think that you don't you don't really believe that you're just doing what you're told. That's where people get that idea of Christian yes. that we we just believe we're not we don't actually know why. Yeah, it's really helped them. Um, what is the word? I can't think of the word. 
when you're um, walking out your space, there's a certain mm-hmm. word. And when you're, when you're getting kind of the tools to actually be able to evangelize. Discipleship? Huh? Not discipleship. There's another word. I can't think of it. Um, mm-hmm. Just when you're discussing yeah. things and it's building your faith and you're learning about things too, like, you know, as we talk about Calvinism, other, other stuff, we're all researchers. So when you dive in and you research and then you compare it to the word of God, it bolsters the truth. And so you're more mm-hmm. equipped to go out and share the correct gospel. You're and have an out. answer for everybody. Is yeah. Ed- edification? So, what was that? Edification? Yeah, edification, but that's not the right word. I'll, I'll think of it at three in the morning. I'll wake up straight up in bed. You guys later. Thanks for having me on, you guys. It was a huge blessing to me. Thank you. Awesome. All right. All right wonderful. I uh, had a great time, and I always do, and especially on Fridays because it's dedicated to having fun. And uh, I certainly did have fun tonight with everybody. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody will uh, join uh, Sister Lisa and friends tomorrow night on her channel for the Most High Jesus. And then on Sunday, don't forget, we have our Sunday church service on this same channel, Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, that's at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, everybody, for participating tonight. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.